Astonishing Legends would like to thank the Great Courses Plus, Harry's, Bombas, and our supporters at Patreon for making tonight's show possible. With the first two parts of our series in the Black Monk of Pontefract behind us now, we hope that you're feeling familiar with the contemporaneous aspects of the story, the players, and the events. Now it's time to take it a step further and look underneath the events at what may be happening at 30 East Drive. At Astonishing Legends, we call this type of show the analysis episode, and this is where the rubber meets the paranormal road. There have, of course, been more recent investigations done at the house, some with startling evidence. We'll talk about those tonight, as well as the idea and nature of poltergeists versus ghosts and even demons. We'll also discuss the possibility of a hoax, which every good investigator into stories like these must consider. We've been in touch with the current owner of the home who does not live in it, and he's put us in contact with a caretaker who has seen many things herself at 30 East Drive over the years. And tonight, she will be a guest on the show. So sit back, relax, well, as much as anyone can for a story like this, and get ready for the final download. When we're finished, you can make your own decision about who or what you think the Black Monk of Pontefract is. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Yesterday, upon the stair... I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. Poet and educator Hughes Mearns from his poem Antigonish, published in 1922. Join us tonight for part three of our series on the Black Monk of Pontefract. And we're back. Man, I love that poem from the opening. In fact, Marie Mayhew, who's in, oh, our, that's right. who's in our research group, was talking about it the other day. And I remembered that I had been obsessed with it since I heard it in a movie, which I thought was The Sixth Sense. But she said, no, it's Identity. <laughs> Both great movies. But anyway, it's a pretty amazing poem. Well, it's not hard to believe because she's obsessed with John Cusack. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> <laughs> I and don't, I don't mind telling the world that I, she would agree with that. You know, Hughes Mirrors actually wrote it first as a song for a play that he penned in 1899, and then he republished it as a poem in 1922. That's right. And then Glenn Miller recorded it in 1939 with his orchestra and a singer named Tex Beneke. And that version is a version you've probably heard before. You just don't know it. You've at least heard the music. When you hear it, it's instantly familiar. It's like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is so great. And I wanted to use it here, but Sony owns the license now, and I was afraid they would take Blanket Fortiana from us. And the ghost of Glenn Miller <laughs> and Tex Beneke would sue us. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn Miller, Somehow. who mysteriously disappeared, by the way, and a lot yeah. of people think was a spy. Right, in a transatlantic flight. Yeah, his plane, believe. but his body That's was right. never found. That's true. Uh, well, the coolest thing about Hughes Mirrors is that he essentially invented the discipline of creative writing and education. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And he specifically focused on kids in his development of it. So that's extra cool. Yeah, he is the father of creative writing in school, yeah. which is pretty awesome. And that fits so well here, too, because there's almost a Dr. Seuss-like quality to that poem. Oh, absolutely. And apparently he wrote a bunch of parodies of it himself. Listen to this one. He called it Alibi. These, and these parodies, he called them Later Antigonishes. As I was falling down the stair, I met a bump that wasn't there. It might have put me on the shelf. Except I wasn't there myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's like Dr. Seuss uh, suffering an existential crisis. Yeah, uh, I know. love that. And yeah. I got that, by the way, from John Robert Colombo's book, Ghost Stories of Canada. So that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. By the way, stay tuned tonight after the end credits to hear Forrest read the full original Antigonish poem. Oh, I didn't know I, you'd rope me into that. Yeah. I had plans. You're roped. Okay. All right. Well, all right, folks. <laughs> After that little history lesson, it's time to point out that the Halloween hoodies are being printed as we record this right now. And they may even be up in the store by the time this show goes up. So get ready for those. And Scott, can we go ahead and pull a couple of those out for just you and me? Uh, I have a feeling they're not going to last. Uh, you know what? I think you might be right. By the way, while we'll be doing more hoodies in the future, this first run is a limited edition 
fall Halloween printing in special Halloween colors. Ooh, I hope they smell like pumpkin spice. Well, here, here's something no. we sh- <laughs> we'll look into that, I, I swear. But here's something we should have pointed out ages ago. Tess Feifel, our head of research, has been doing an amazing job lately, not only with a ton of fascinating blog posts at our website, astonishinglegends.com, but also with the two newsletters she writes with every episode. One of those is for all the listeners, and then the other is for our Patreon supporters. The Patreon one has a ton of extra information that did not make it into whatever the latest episode was. Yeah, that's called the cutting room floor. And if you're wanting to go super deep on the most recent topic, you cannot beat the stuff she's dug up in there. The most recent one actually has a ton of fascinating info on poltergeists that seem to focus primarily on starting fires. I really love that. That was like they were starting fires inside walls and houses that didn't even have electricity. Yeah, there you go. Uh... (laughs) I don't know if that saves you money or not. Uh, it <laughs> depends uh, on how you look at it. Well, I enjoy this section on poltergeist with bad smells uh, because no reflection on me <laughs> sitting at the table here. Uh, I'm but so yeah, hot. I'm very, I'm very smell sensitive. Yes. And it's just fascinating. It's just pervasive. It's universal with these kinds of things. So I don't know if we've even mentioned it yet, but in Pontifract, they not only smell the perfume smell, but sometimes rotting flesh or wet dog, a smell everyone instantly knows. Every Patreon newsletter Tess has ever written is also archived and available if you want to go back in time with those. You can sign up for our regular newsletter at astonishinglegends.com slash subscribe or on our Facebook page. If you are or become a Patreon supporter, Tess will send you a link when you join for access to the Patreon Plus version. Okay, so before we hop back into Pontifract, and we've got a great show for you tonight, we wanted to mention a podcast we recently discovered that we really like and know you guys will dig it too, so commit this one to your memory. It's called The Brain Food Show, and if you like Astonishing Legends, it's going to be right up your alley. Yeah, The Brain Food Show is a podcast brought to you by the team behind the wildly popular Today I Found Out YouTube channel, which has nearly 1.6 million subscribers. Their podcast does deep dives into historical curiosities, everything from how famed Enlightenment thinker Voltaire made his fortune by helping to rig the lottery, to that time Julius Caesar was captured by pirates and the hilarity that ensued. Yeah, Voltaire used to chill with the Count of St. Germain, too, and I know the Count really never liked that guy. Remember that that was that quote that, oh, he's the man who knows everything and never dies. Oh, and that's then you right. Get, you have to read it, though, with sarcasm. Yes, But indeed. people know they're like, oh, he's praising him. Like, no, no he was That's wasn't. right. Voltaire slammed the Count of St. <laughs> Germain. That's right. You don't do that because he's going to outlast. Yeah. yeah. And I actually love the latest brain food show they posted, How Shrunken Heads Were Made. I like to compare recipes. And, you know, I actually learned a little bit about that in that uh, music ethnicology class because they studied South American cultures. Yeah. And uh, it involves hot sand. Oh, I'll nice. just give you that pointer. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, so everybody look for the brain food show. All of that's part of the name there. Anywhere you get your podcasts. Okay. So let's change gears here and roll into the Black Monk of Pontifract. And we have such a great show for you tonight. Tonight, we're going to start by recapping what we talked about last week, which was the large series of events that culminated in poor Diane being strangled and dragged up the stairs right. by her neck and cardigan. Yeah, um, it was all fun and games. Yes. Uh, more fun for Fred. Right. Uh, but it kind of took a dark turn. Let's recount some of those events. And these aren't necessarily in exact chronological order, but they're pretty close. We had uh, the sandwich that had gotten thrown off the plate of food. And when they picked it up, it had a bite taken out of it. This yeah. was in a matter of seconds. It was behind the TV, up. I think. Yeah, it was on the floor behind the TV. We had the thing with the eggs where Mrs. Pritchard sat on the wooden crate and the eggs were still materializing in front of them and breaking on the floor. Interpenetration of matter. Yes. We had the food vandalism, the jam and the toilet paper on the door handles. We had the exorcism that they tried to do sort of piecemeal that didn't work out and led to clanging and banging all night the night that they did that. The crucifix the next day that flew off the wall and stuck to Diane's back and she they mm-hmm. couldn't get it off of her, right. even though Philip and her mother were pulling on it. Yeah, The inverted crosses painted in gold paint in a very perfect way. They were upside down on all the doors in the house, which I guess had a gloss finish. And right. it was difficult for Gene to replicate. Yeah. Well, we were, we were joking about that. Like, if you could actually see that happening, is it a, <laughs> my favorite Martian, we always go back to this idea. Invisible can. <laughs> just, well, the can's, the can's visible. You can't yeah. see somebody holding it, but it's just kind of floating in the air, like, you know, yeah. doing this. Or how does that work? Or what does it just spontaneously appear? Exactly. Right. What are the mechanics of that? Because that was just the idea that uh, it must have come from Philip's 
can of gold spray paint because he was going to paint his bike that color. Yeah. So then uh, we also had the keys that fell out of the chimney, including the, the 19 keys with the one extra old one that was unrecognized and they never figured out what it went to. Then we had the first visual appearance of a monk-like figure showing itself to the neighbor, Mrs. Mountain, who lived yeah. next door when they went right. over and asked her if she'd seen anything. And then finally, the other one that we talked about was, of course, the assault on Diane. So that's a lot of serious activity going on in the house. Escalation. Uh, it, all right, this all leads up to Fred, or the spirit, finally leaving them alone and disappearing. And these are the mm -hmm. circumstances under which he or it vanished. Philip, the son, and Diane, the daughter, were in the lounge, as it says in the book, which I presume for us Americans is a living room. Living room, parlor. Parlor, yeah. For, if, for you if, know, <laughs> when I think of lounge, I think of a hotel yeah. and you're having a drink, but that's... Uh... <laughs> oh, right, of course. But it depends on the house. If it's a, uh, an old Victorian house here in the States, you might have a parlor where guests come in, but it's a little more public place in the house to right. do entertaining than it is one of the other chambers, shall we say. So, uh, yeah, it's a little different here. Yeah, in the States, generally probably the living room. Right, so they're watching television, and then Philip notices something moving past the frosted door on the other side of the room that leads to the dining room in the kitchen. And what he's thinking at first is, you know, not sure what that is, but it could be a neighbor. Either way, it's something, someone has come into the house. It could possibly be someone popping over to say hello. He looks over at it, and Diane sees what he's looking at. She looks over, too. They both see this figure. So he gets up, he goes over there, and he opens the door, and in the kitchen he sees a tall, black figure mm -hmm. that, again, looks like a monk, or it's in the habit of a monk, or shaped like a monk. And as he's looking at it, it slowly descends into the floor in the kitchen. And that was the last time the Pritchard family saw anything in that house. So, you know, I don't know if it came to say goodbye or, and, and they don't really know <laughs> no. why it left, but yeah. this is a standard thing with poltergeist events. They say that it comes on suddenly and that it leaves suddenly. And this yeah. was a very sudden departure. Who knows why? What's time on the other side, as we've said before? You know, yeah. To him, it's like, hey, I was gone a minute. It's like, oh, that was two years here. Right. And with one line of thinking about poltergeist is that, you know, again, it's very much tied to the people living there. So kids grow up. They go through puberty. They get out of phases. It's said that uh, small children will not see something psychically until a certain age. And then, you know, as you get older, it's like, well, that's not possible. And you start to forget about it. So there are phases to these kind of things, what we experience and then maybe what goes on on the other side, if you're of a mind of the spirit world. Well, yeah, and apparently after this, they had heard or they came across somebody. I mean, this almost seems like a cliche, but they someone had said to them that, uh, if you put garlic around the house, it'll keep evil spirits away. So Philip went out and bought, apparently, a bunch of dried garlic, and they put it up all over the house. And that, yeah. you know, that's a clear indication that they thought something was happening. I guess the whole house smelled like garlic. <laughs> so one of the things that's hard to know is whether it was on its way out the door anyway, <laughs> right. or, and the garlic helped, or it didn't. I mean, what is this, a cheesy vampire movie? <laughs> I don't know. Well, these things people don't make up. They come from tradition, which maybe thousands of years ago people made up. I, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know where the first idea came from. But here's a little fun thing. When I was a kid, I, I didn't know why this was the case, but I would often notice, at least here in the United States, that uh, some curtain rods on the ends, we had them in our own house, decorative. They were plastic, of course, but they were acorns on the ends of the curtain rods. It's like, so why is that a common decoration here? And I learned later that that is also kind of a botanical to keep out bad spirits, acorns. People yeah. used to tie a, uh, at least two, a couple of acorns or a bunch above the windows and doors. It's always about entryways, windows, doors. Why so much activity on the stairs? If you look at one of the photos that we got from the 30 East website, 30eastdrive.com, there is a black mass shadow on the stairs. That was kind of our hero image for that episode. Yes. So you can get a gander at this. You want to know what it looks like. There are a lot of pictures there. Like. Yeah. And there's a lot of pictures on the stairs. And there's some that were even taken by the author that we're about to discuss in our next topic here. Yeah. I saw a man who wasn't there. Yes. On the stair. Why? But again, to me, if the stairs are a transition point from one level to another... 
It's a passageway still within the house. Well, and, and again, what we're seeing as people who have started to investigate this stuff a lot, we're coming up on our four-year anniversary oh, since that's we launched right. the show, yep. which is pretty amazing. What we're seeing is a lot of times with hauntings and spiritual stuff, stairs are involved. That's where all the best pictures are. There's always, it's the stairs. Yeah, so yeah. Stuff is happening on the stairs, and you're going to see more of that tonight, even as we talk about some of these incidents that happen coming up here. Yeah. So we've been checking out ancient Mesopotamia, life in the cradle of civilization over at the Great Courses Plus, and we've learned that there sure were a lot of firsts that came out of that part of the world. But one important first that people probably don't think about is kings. Mm. We're so used to the idea of kingship since the idea was invented in either ancient Mesopotamia or Egypt that we think they've always been around. True, but that wasn't the case. During the Uruk era, from about 3800 to 3100 BCE, before the first kings, it seems the priests were in charge of organizing the population. And that made sense to these ancient peoples because it was the priests who could interpret what the gods wanted from humans. So how could someone who didn't have that connection to the heavens come to rule over the people? Well, one theory is that these first kings only held that leadership position for brief periods of time, like for a major battle, and once it was over, they stepped down. But then maybe when the battles were more frequent, they were required more often. They're the ones who could have negotiated with the enemy. Their troops would have felt a special loyalty to them, and in periods of constant war, they could just stay in power. If it was the custom that sons took over their father's jobs and responsibilities, then the warlord's eldest son became heir to the throne once dad passed away. Historians are still guessing at this, but it could explain how royal families started. Oh, one interesting thing I learned is that the word for king in Sumerian is Lugal, which literally translates to big man. So maybe these uh, first kings you, were... You're not going there, are you? What? <laughs> <laughs> suggest that these first kings were giants? Uh -huh. <laughs> Why, I wouldn't dare. No, I actually think that it's more likely that it was a figure of speech, you know, and that these ancient rulers were probably big, charismatic, impressive warriors. Okay, good. <laughs> well, our listeners can get started becoming kings and queens of knowledge with this special limited time offer. Probably giants. I, oh God. As I was saying, a full month of <laughs> unlimited access is yours for free to check out this or any other fantastic course, but you must go through our special URL. You can bring entire worlds of learning to your screens, free and unlimited for a whole month by signing up today at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Remember, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Giants. This is Steve Hayes in New Brunswick, and when I'm not podcasting about He-Man and Masters of the Universe, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. So now we want to talk a little bit about the more recent investigations, because there have been some. The most well-documented one was conducted by an amateur paranormal investigator turned author named Andy Evans. He took a hard look as recently as 2015 at what was going on on 30 East Drive, and the results of his work show that something is still there. Not only that, it seems to thrive on the attention it receives, and that's something that's going to come up for us again here in October. Now, Evan's book is called Don't Look Back in Anger, The Black Monk of Pontifract, and it came out, as I said, just three years ago in 2015. I did want to talk a little bit about his background because I think it's useful to understand his perspective as he went into this investigation. Generations of Andy Evans' family were coal miners in Featherston, West Yorkshire, just two miles southwest of Pontefract. And that was work he was excited about growing up and growing into, and he would have stayed in it if he could. He himself was a coal miner before changes in the industry, quote by him, put him behind a desk within the criminal justice system. <laughs> so uh, mm. he's since written several books, the one on the Black Monk being one of them. We read it, of course, and while it covers a lot of the events we've shared about what the Pritchards originally went through, it also talked about some of the things he experienced in his own recent investigation. So I guess to set the stage, you have to understand what he found when he went to try and access the house today. It's still there. It hasn't been torn down. Right. And it could be occupied, but it's not. He got in touch with the current owner of the house, a gentleman named Bill Bungie. Now, Bill, surprisingly, is a movie producer <laughs> and actually has an EP, an executive producer credit, on a movie that you and I both loved, Forrest. Do you know what that movie was? 
Uh, You're not going to know this. So I'm putting you on this. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just play dumb. Okay. To, to Do you know? With. I think I just momentarily it's forgot. Moon. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, so uh, which yeah. is a really, really amazing film with Sam, Sam Rockwell. Rockwell. And uh, I would say that although I enjoyed Tom Cruise's Oblivion a great deal, yeah. Moon, as David Spade used to say, I liked it better the first time when it was <laughs> called Moon. So if you haven't <laughs> well, seen that movie, it's like an indie science fiction film, but it's really strong writing and Sam Rockwell's a, just unbelievable. Yeah, Sam yeah. Rockwell, tour de force and uh, also involved in the production, I believe, David Bowie's son. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, it was very cool. And Bungie went on to produce an indie horror film based on the events at 30 East Drive called When the Lights Went Out. And that came out in 2012, and that was directed by his friend Pat Holden. So the reason that Bill Bungie got the house was because it was cheap. He found that it was on the market. He had been interested in the story. I'm not sure exactly when it was, but I know that Philip, the older boy from the story, who was the teen, older teenager when everything happened, was in his 50s when Bill bought the house. And we've actually been in touch with Bill. We've exchanged emails with him, and we may be talking to him next year. So we'll see what happens there. But when he finished the horror movie, When the Lights Went Out, he arranged for a contest, and he had two of the winners of the contest got to watch the movie in the house, <laughs> which is a pretty great idea. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, genius marketing there. But the neighbors around the area have reported that Fred, or the entity, or whatever it is in that house, is actually still around and kind of moving from home to home every now and then, but things had been quiet for a while. Yeah. But now that there was activity at the house, it had re-manifested in a way, which is, this is something that's going to come up the more that we talk about this particular type of haunting and this haunting in general. And Bill has, because he doesn't live in the house, he lives in London about 100 miles away, he has a caretaker or a key holder, as they say over there, and her name is Carol Fieldhouse. And it took a week or two, but Bill did put us in touch with Carol, and our discussion with her was really enlightening. She had a lot of specific additional information, but we only just got to talk to her Friday morning, the 21st of September, 2018. So here's what's amazing about that. She lives in the house next door, the one that is connected to 30 East Drive, and her husband, Darren, is the grandson of Mrs. Mountain, the one who saw the black monk in her kitchen all those years ago. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Carol told us later in the show and play a small portion of our hour-long interview with her. But one of the things that Andy Evans had said was that she, of course, had seen quite a lot of stuff herself, personally. And we just wanted to go in here and talk a little bit about some of the things that Bill experienced after he purchased the house during a time that he was trying to make a documentary on it, mm -hmm. uh, different from his other movie. These are the things that they reported. They're going to sound familiar to you. One thing they reported was that there was a kettle turning on in the kitchen and frequently superheating, mm. just getting super hot on its own pretty quickly. They reported that they had a remote, I guess, for the thermostat. It has an updated thermostat of some kind, and when they were in there this uh, remote would vanish. The other thing that's important to understand about Bill is because he was setting it up to use for marketing, he had gone out and bought a bunch of period furniture, the best he could get from thrift stores, to make the experience feel real for people that came to visit. And in fact, I'll read this little section from uh, Andy Evans' book, Don't Look Back in Anger, The Black Monk of Pontifrac. This is from pages 41 and 42. On selling the property five years before, the Pritchards had left little of their existence there, and the purchasing film producer had filled the property with furnishings from local charity shops in an attempt to recreate the early 70s. So that's just to set the stage. There's a reason that I pointed that out, and you're going to find that out in a second. But one of the uh, things that Bill, I guess, personally experienced was there was an outside gate that opened on its own while he was out there, and he was moved away from it. And this is a gate with a plunger-style latch, mm -hmm. and he just looked back, and it was open. I don't believe he heard it. It was one of those things that happened without yeah. any sound and rather quickly. And he did not look back in anger. He did not look back in anger. <laughs> and then uh, this is the other one that's really fascinating to me. There's a neighbor named Darren who lived close by and also I guess was a caretaker in one form or another when uh, Bill had the house and Bill had come in there one day and Darren was down on the floor picking up a jigsaw puzzle like a hundred pieces of jigsaw puzzle that were all scattered all over the floor that he said he found and he was picking them up and attempting to put them back into the jigsaw puzzle box here's the thing about that the jigsaw puzzle box was yet another sort of prop thing thing that Bill had bought from a thrift shop yeah. to simulate a 70s bookshelf or whatever, this yeah. jigsaw puzzle. When Darren was trying to put the pieces back in, the box was fully taped shut 
It's not that it hadn't been opened. It wasn't brand new, but it was taped shut yeah. at the thrift store, presumably, so that no pieces would get lost. Right. And then brought to the house. And then when Darren was picking the pieces up, there was no way for the pieces to have gotten out of the box because it was still taped shut. And Bill watched him have to cut it open to get them put back away. Ah, the transmutation. Interpenetration. Inter. It's... Stick with the word. Get the word. <laughs> Interpenetration. The interlocution. Of right. Yeah. Interlocution. It's, so it's uh, basically things going through solid matter to end up somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, just there like the go. eggs. Yeah, I know. And so now it's the jigsaw puzzle. And by the way, here we are again making a mess. That's kind of a hassle. Somebody's got to clean it up. Gosh, much better though than the peanut butter and eggs. Yes, yeah. much better than peanut butter and eggs. There was all kinds of stuff that happened like that. The uh, One of the other things that happened, and this was for me, you know, it was indicative of the first round of events with the Pritchards, which was many decades earlier. Mm -hmm. Keys were disappearing from the documentary crew. Their own keys were disappearing. So these keys are all getting rounded up again. And there was one set, of, I guess it was a full set of keys that fully disappeared that belonged to one of the producers of the documentary, not Bill, somebody else, I believe. They could not find them for the longest time. And then eventually, I guess they went to move this vacuum that there was in the house there. And mm -hmm. when they went to move, they heard something and they opened it up, unzipped the bag. And this is an old style vacuum with the bag on the back and the whole nine yards. They unzip it and the keys are inside the bag in the vacuum. This vacuum was another prop item that Bill had bought just to have sitting around to look like the house was from the 70s. He did not even know if it worked. And to his knowledge and everyone else's in the house, it had never even been turned on. Yeah. So somehow that producer's keys wound up inside the vacuum. This is fairly recently. Now, when you think about it, because that movie came out in 2012. So we're talking about the early part of the 2010s, mm -hmm. of the teens, I guess. You have to wonder... Going back to the interpenetration of matter, did the keys, were they just beamed in there, Star Trek style? <laughs> right. Or did some, yeah. when something wasn't looking, it, you know, the zippers magically went up in the air and the keys went yes. and floated in? I don't Th know. That's kind of a little bit, uh, again, the, the two theories in physics, if you had the Star Trek transporter, do your atoms disintegrate and then get shot in a beam, like a laser beam, to another location, and uh, they get reassembled there by a machine? Or... Are you basically just recreated somewhere else out of the atoms that are existing somewhere else? Out of whole cloth. Yeah, right. So that, how like, does that happen? I feel like if it was the former, which I'll call the Willy Wonka method, uh, <laughs> yeah. versus the latter, if I got those right, yeah. I think that uh, you would lose your soul if you were just recreated somewhere well, some else. Some people don't believe in the soul. You know? Yeah. Some people believe that the reason you have jet lag, it's your soul catching up to you. Yeah. I, read that. I think it's just your circadian rhythm is off, but hey, oh. what do I know? <laughs> All right. Southwest so <laughs> Magazine. Yeah. Uh, needs to update their articles. So here's uh, one of the other events that happened. This happened to Andy. And uh, as he got into his amateur investigation, he didn't really know a whole lot about what he was doing, which we can relate to when it came to investigating the house. So he was learning as he went and he was trying to look into the story. And I wanted to read this section from his book, Don't Look Back in Anger, The Black Monk of Pontefract. This is on page 36 in the Kindle edition of the book. The chairs, however, had moved, despite both of us witnessing Carol push all four of the seats back beneath the table. All four were now obviously pulled away as if waiting for guests to be seated. Adding more to the mystery, the Bible had also moved from its original position. What he's talking about there was there was a Bible on the kitchen counter, and they actually have photos of this. That's right. It was in this original position when they came in. The first thing that Carol said when they went in was, he must be around because it wasn't even there on the counter the yeah. other day, and no one had been in the house. Then they went around and were doing some things and looking at the house, and they came back, and it had moved. And they had photos to prove that. Of course, you could easily say, here's a picture, slide the Bible, take another picture. Yeah, but it's not video. We're taking them on their word at this right. point. And if you want to see that photo, we did not include that one on our webpage for the episode, but it will be on the 30eastdrive.com website yes, under, under visitors' photos. And what's funny, the caption accompanying the second photo, because they took one before where you see the Bible on the counter and it's very still, very clean. The second one's a little out of focus because the photographer was so freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> so the, he was shaking the camera a little. And that's one of the things they said, one of the first steps you take when you do an investigation like this, and this is a note for you and me, Forrest, is before you do anything, go in and take a picture of everything, of everything. in every room yeah. so that you can determine whether or not something's been moved. Right. To continue reading this quote, digital cameras thankfully offer us the basics of modern photography, 
without the need for expertise. Dark rooms and never-ending waiting for family snaps are thankfully now replaced with instant playback. In minutes, the digital world reinforced what we suspected. The Bible had moved. Not just a small movement, but about 60 centimeters across the kitchen work surface and angled in a different position. Chairs previously observed being neatly placed beneath the table by Carol were once again pulled back. Space on each for someone to be seated on. We now had our first two pieces of evidence to work with. A Bible which had been moved and four chairs seemingly altered in position from when we last viewed them in a locked room. The other thing I want to point out here, that's the end of that quote, and again, that's from Andy Evans' book. The other thing I want to point out here is that the kitchen can be locked, and that's going to be a recurring theme. The Pritchard family was putting locks in the house in interior doors. So Mm -hmm. think about what that tells you. Now, first of all, obviously, if you can pass an egg through a door, how is a lock going to keep a ghost out, especially a a feisty (laughs) evil one that um, likes eggs? But it's interesting that the family was doing that, and also that door had been locked, and Carol seems to have a habit of locking the doors, sort of in a tradition of how they deal with whatever is in that house. She also locks the doors in her own house next door, which she told us in our interview with her. Yeah, you know where else that happened? I just now thought of this uh, as you're talking about it, where the people who went into a house after it had been occupied by previous owners found something strange, which is locks on the interior doors and cabinets. Yeah, what? The Sherman Ranch. That's right. Skinwalker Skin Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch. That's right. You don't want your peanut butter and your chocolate getting mixed up on your walls and floors. Yeah. They had noticed that there weren't still locks on them, but there had been, uh, you could see where somebody had bolted locks on the cabinets, I believe. Yeah. No, uh, I remember yeah. that detail too. It's been a while, so but yeah. More crazy activity in a different format there. Yeah. And I guess Andy Evans took five pictures of the stairs And the fourth and fifth of the pictures, which he'd all taken in close succession, had a black blob on them. And you can see these photos yourself at 30eastdrive.com. It's one of many images he took in the house. Anywhere that you see, they don't use full names when they're at at the website when they're saying what visitors. But if you see Andy E., that's him. It was the Uh, author when he was writing the book. And his stare shot for me, in a way, is even creepier than the ones we borrowed for social media when we were doing the Mm -hmm. social media on the first couple episodes here because it's kind of this dark purplish look. It's very dim. Oh, you're looking at the... uh, So wait, are you talking about the one on the stairs? There's two shots. Uh, They're actually butted up against each other, left and right. Yes. I believe that is looking at that with uh, ultraviolet light, which is why it's kind of purple. Well, there you go. So in the second picture, there's a black shape on the stairs and it's less humanoid. It's almost more like a pillar, but yeah. it's there and it's, it's there. very pronounced. There's also a smear. It looks like a traveling misty smudge going over the railing off to the left side. Yes. And one of the things that Andy talks about in his investigation, you can read his book to get, there's a whole lot in there that we're not going to go over because a lot of it is really similar to uh, what the Pritchard family experienced. But one of the things that he talks about is how the sound is always where you're not. If you're upstairs, it's downstairs. If you're downstairs, it's upstairs. He said it had them running all over the house like a Benny Hill sketch. I mean, it just was crazy. Uh, But one of the things that he did that I also thought was super interesting was he got some really amazing EVPs, almost inadvertently. They made some recordings where they were talking because they were trying to document what they were doing. So I want to read this excerpt about that he got a whole bunch of EVPs, and he actually even wound up taking a spirit box in there later, and there's a bunch of dialogue that happened with that. We're not going to get into that because uh, we don't really have time for that in part three of this episode. We'll be talking about those more in the future, but... Spirit uh, box stuff, I will say, sounds really creepy. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. If you want a good Halloween scare, sit in the dark late at night, put your headphones on, and play some clips on YouTube. Yeah, they're pretty crazy, and that's like the app that our friend created. There's varying versions of how these work, but he uh, created the one that's called Spirit Story Box. That's right. Created by uh, friends that we met at a Kent Paranormal Weekend, we mentioned them before, Roger and Jill Pingleton, and they have Streamside software. They do other apps as well. Yeah. So they also make real world spirit story boxes that have all this analog gear in them and scan radio frequencies and all that it's sort of more thing. Like, yeah, let's say like it's a more like a scan. It doesn't, I don't think it flips through frequencies, but it's basically it's like a radio receiver yeah. picking up audio signals or uh, something forming let's say, signals that transform into words, and there's an echo with it, and it creeps you out. <laughs> right. Yeah. And this, all right, so Andy Evans and his team decided they are going to try to get some recordings inside 
the house at 30 East Drive. So they're in there and they're just using a phone. They don't have a lot of gear. He wound up purchasing gear. It's funny, I can relate to this because the same thing's happening to us where each time we do something, we're like, oh, we got to go buy that thing. I'm going to go buy that thing. And believe me, there's websites out there where they're just waiting for people like you to come along and, hey, look what we got. Well, I did this. thousand dollars. Yeah, I did that way before we started the show. I just bought something like, I'm going to use that. And then you don't end up using it. Yeah. So uh, we're getting there ourselves. But I guess he was just in there with his phone and he did this recording. And this particular recording, there's a lot of recordings he talks about in his book, but this particular one really stood out to me. And I want to read this little section. This is from page 61 of... Andy Evans, Don't Look Back in Anger, The Black Monk of Pontefract. And that's a Kindle edition, page 61. The audio recordings, however, were different. We were in the main bedroom and nothing seemed to be happening to support the house's haunted reputation. Impatient for evidence, I suggested we should wait another five minutes and then go downstairs into the living room. Playback on the recording clearly makes out an unidentified female voice say, yes, I think so too. What do you think? Even stranger, a man's voice is recorded saying, yes, downstairs is best. I simply could not explain the voices interrupting our conversation. The recording was taken through the simple capabilities of a mobile telephone, and at that point, we were not privy to any radio station scanning devices said to encourage voices and communication with those on a different spiritual level. The voices were real on the recording, but had never been part of the original conversation. The recordings gave evidence to suggest whatever was present within the house seemed to gain energy from human interaction. Whenever we sat in silence for periods of time simply listening in darkness, the audio playback offered nothing in the way of spirit activity. Break times, however, when we relaxed and chatted about everyday subjects were different. Short snippets of background conversations could be momentarily heard. It almost seemed as if it was us that were being investigated and scrutinized by an unseen audience. I love that passage. And I love this. He says, you know, hey, maybe we should go downstairs. And the voice says, yeah, I think so too. What do you think? And then someone else says, yes, downstairs is best. (laughs) It's like, what's happening? Are are they participating? Are they trying to push them a certain way? Is this something that's on their side or on the other side? Do these things on the other side think they're part of the investigation? It's so fast. It opens so many questions. And there is audio available at 30 East Drive too. I didn't want to try and rip that off. If anybody wants to see it, you should go check it out. I think some of these EVPs are probably over there. Yeah. But it's a pretty fascinating scenario when you think about it. And just to be in an environment like that, even if in this case you're not necessarily dealing with whatever the evil spirit was that taunted the Pritchards, unless it's something pretending to be nice. There's just so many questions that it asks. And that's all, I guess, if you believe Andy's telling the truth, which is what you have to ask yourself about this entire story and the possibility that this is a long series of hoaxes, which we'll be looking at as well. So Andy Evans' investigation evolves, and he decides that he's going to get some motion detectors into the mix, which is what a lot of paranormal investigators do. And so he goes out and gets some, and they put some upstairs and downstairs, and they've got cameras set up, and they're trying to see if anything triggers the motion detectors. Once again, they're getting messed with, just like everybody else who's ever been in the house, the motion detector is going off upstairs and then they go upstairs and they can't see anything or it's going off downstairs. And they go through this experience, which is pretty fascinating. They had an alarm that would go off if the motion detector went off. There's two interesting passages here about this. Uh, We decided to set one of the alarms in what had been Philip Pritchard's bedroom and close the door to eliminate any movement from outside the room. The second alarm was positioned downstairs in the living room, pointing towards the glass panel doors at the bottom of the stairs. With both rooms locked off, we settled ourselves into the kitchen to discuss a plan for the night ahead. Within 10 minutes, the loud, high-pitched alarm resounded from the motion detector upstairs. Collectively, we hurried upstairs to disarm the apparatus. No sooner was silence resumed, the detector downstairs gave out its signal that movement had been detected in the closed downstairs living room. That's from page 81 in the Kindle edition of the book. Whatever was triggering movement, this is a different passage, wanted to divide us. We decided, however, to stay together and use joint wisdom against whatever unseen forces were surrounding us. We now set both detectors upstairs, The one night vision camcorder we had at our disposal was placed immediately behind one of the detectors. On cue, the audio alarm broke the silence. Video footage was instantly played back, and it recorded the motion detector turning slowly to the right. It now faced the wall. He says, excitement exploded within me. I now had raw footage of the poltergeist. The motion detector clearly turns almost 90 degrees, and on playback, it is evident no one enters the room. However, and this is one of the things that I really liked about uh, Evan's book, 
when he looked into it, he had to come to another conclusion and forced him. This is all getting to a point that I want to hear from you about, because this is one of your favorite things. I think <laughs> This is something you brought up before. Okay. He goes on to add, like everything we capture, either visual or audible, we try to replicate it for authenticity. Only what cannot be reproduced would we record as being unexplained activity, which could be attributed evidence of a true haunting. Glenn raised his concern the glass-topped bedside cabinet on which the sensor sat could have acted as a low-friction slide exaggerated by the high-pitched alarm on the sensor. We tested this theory immediately, and sure enough, the motion detector, once activated, slowly began to turn clockwise towards the wall. Disappointment now replaced excitement. Vibration from the audible alarm caused the rotation. One small glimmer of hope, however, prevailed. And this is the part I marked in bold because I, I can't wait to hear what Forrest has to say about this. <laughs> right. On playback, movement was detected seconds before the alarm sounded. It was impossible an inanimate object could predict something which would have an effect on it. Unfortunately, despite this, the evidence had to be put onto the back burner. So what they're saying here is when the alarm went off, it's sitting on this glass table or there's glass on top of this right. piece of furniture, which you see all the time, especially in 70s thrift store furniture. <laughs> and, <laughs> a lot of brass and glass. <laughs> brass era. and glass. Yeah. Uh, but the alarm goes off and the vibrations from the audio, this thing's making a very loud noise. It yeah. ma makes it rotate around. Right. However, when they go to the footage, they see it beginning to rotate before the sound comes out. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how is that happening? And then the other question, and it's something that I don't remember him even saying in the book, and I guess he's slumping over it a little bit, what triggered the motion detector in the first place? Regardless of whether or not you have proof of it moving, why is it going off and making that noise in the first place? Right. It explains one aspect of it, but not all of it. Right, which yeah. happens all the time, and it's one of our pet peeves. It happens all the time. It doesn't <laughs> stop people from using that explanation to explain all of it, though. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And that's the other thing, and I'm glad you said that, and that's going to be a recurring theme. I think a little bit of something that we talk about tonight, and we've talked about in a lot of shows when it comes to explanations mm -hmm. and whether or not something's a hoax. Is it possible for part of a story to be a hoax? Is yeah. it possible that something happened to somebody and then they became enthralled with the kind of attention they got and then they continued to repeat or try to reproduce it themselves just because you prove that they did something later? Yeah. Where is your theorem that proves that that means the very first thing that happened was also perpetrated as a falsehood? You can make an assumption about it, but it's circumstantial because if you don't have proof that the initial action was a hoax, right. then you can't fairly say, regardless of what percentage of hoaxes happened downstream. Yeah. Now, of course, a lot of people would be like, well, yeah, but this points to character. If you're willing to hoax it later, you might hoax it at the beginning. And I'm getting ahead of myself because we're going to talk a little bit more about hoaxes in, the, in our theories here in a minute. But I just wanted to point that out, that just because something happens one time doesn't mean something else isn't happening another time, unless you can categorically say that you have proof from start to finish. The problem with that is, is that the story materializes, it becomes amazing on somebody else's watch, and then nobody comes to check it out until later. And then if you have the added pressure of investigators or reporters or people showing up to look at something that you right. claim has happened, at that point, you either need it to happen again or you look like a complete fool. So yeah. there's all kinds of extra stuff to consider there. It's the baby with the bathwater uh, yeah. position, I say. It's, it's like... I think what you're getting at here is another famous case that happened in England a few years later. And that one was widely suspect, held suspect by a lot of skeptics and also investigators. And in many instances, rightfully so, when you look at what happened and what they discovered, which we'll be talking about, my point is here, you can take one thing of like, oh, look, there you go. There's a fishing line. They pulled the rocking chair. That's why the rocking chair's rocking. It's one of the kids. They're playing a prank. So all of this the last five years is baloney. And I think that's an easy position because you can wrap this up with a bow. It's all humbug. Let's move on from this. Let's go home. It doesn't mean that what happened in those years, intervening years prior to that, one incident maybe could have been real. So, you know, we first started thinking about this way back in the Dyatlov Pass episode when we started checking out infrasound and how someone would say, well, in this house, at 30 East Drive in Pontefract, there is some bad air conditioning going on. And what people are saying is due to infrasound. And you can duplicate that with certain people, a very small percentage, I would say. I can't remember. Was it 30, 30 to 40%? No, 30, no, 40 no, 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 no
two or three in a hundred yeah. when they did the experiment in the uh, right. they did a l- theater. Exactly. Yeah. So they tried to duplicate that sound and a very small percentage of people were saying like, yeah, I feel kind of uneasy. I don't see ghosts. Some people though do see a gray blob out of the corner of their eye. And yeah, that's acceptable for some of these cases where there is infrasound. That happened with the guy who first discovered it. He was uh, cleaning his rapier. He was a fencer and uh, he could see the, the, the blade vibrate. He's like, what's going on there? I'm not touching it. That's a valid point. Some people do see blobs, but that's not all ghosts. But there are many who would be like, nope, that's it. It's everything. It explains all ghosts. Let's move on. I don't want to think about this anymore. Let's get out of this house. And what you see here is like, yeah, there's blobs, but they're black blobs and they do different things. There's keys floating. There's gloves conducting uh, hymns. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on that you can't just wrap up with any one thing. That's a super valid point. Well, this leads to the next incident that I wanted to share about uh, Andy. Now, remember how earlier I had talked about how Andy was a coal miner, right? And his Mm -hmm. whole family, he came from generations of coal miners and had the business not changed, which it did, he probably would have been a coal miner the rest of his life. But he had to get out of it because the mines were all closing, politics, government, all that sort of thing. And he had had a fair amount of experience in the mines. And there was one moment in the house during the investigation that he was headed up the stairs. We're back at the stairs, by the way. He was headed up the stairs because a motion detector was going off and he was going up to investigate it. And as he got halfway up the stairs, this deep, dark blackness closed in on him and he suddenly was back in a mine and he couldn't move. He became paralyzed and he described it in his writing as waiting for that fatal cave-in to crush him to death. And it was a very specific feeling that he knew really well And he couldn't get past it, and it was so real, it felt like it was happening to him in that moment on the steps. And the other investigators that were with him had to run up past him to go deal with what was upstairs and then come back and see him as he slowly came out of it. He said it was like nothing he'd ever experienced short of actually being in a mine. That's what he talks about Mm -hmm. in the book. This comes back around to this idea that this thing or these things or whatever's here, it knows what scares you. And it is going to look deep inside you and it's going to pick your worst fear and it's going to present it to you like a present. You just said probably a 10 of the most oft used uh, horror movie trailer lines and one sheet one liners. In a world where it knows what you're afraid of. (laughs) It knows your fear. Well, that's what's happening here. I mean, think about it. Like no one else who was going up the stairs, the Pritchards never talked about feeling like they were in a coal mine. You know what I'm saying? It depends on the experiencer. This is the definition of a personal experience. How's that? Is that less movie trailer? Uh, The story is true. You'll wish it wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) But where did you hear this before? Where some unseen, omniscient, omnipotent force uh, was happening and uh, was one step ahead of the people that were there trying to observe it. Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Also, the Bell Witch. Bell Witch. This, yeah. So, uh, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. <laughs> Jeff the, well, Jeff was more friendly, it seemed. He was, uh, I follow chatty. him on Twitter. <laughs> he should be long dead by now. Is there one? Somehow. Did you, did yeah. you check? There uh, is a Jeff the, the Talking That's, Mongoose on Twitter. Yeah. Oh, geez. Uh, okay. Yeah. Remind me. I, I got to follow uh, yeah, yeah. him or whatever it is. Again, we go back to uh, one of my favorite expressions or analogies. It's the uh, Rich Adams, the window washer. It's not that they can see into the future. Whatever this is, is looking from a different vantage point. So imagine, you know, it's invisible. It can see you. Maybe it's a few seconds ahead. Maybe it can read your mind. Who knows? But it has a leg up on you. And whatever these things are, that seems to be the common theme. They they are one step ahead of you. They know what your next move is going to be, as Philip said, when we were talking about him wrestling this thing off of his sister. It knew what he was going to do before he did. So it's, you're laid open bare like a book and it can read you, which is scary. What's your favorite thing about shaving with Harry's? Well, you know, honestly, there's a lot. I think the first thing for me is the design of the razors and how close the shave is compared to the disposable razors I used to use before I became a Harry's customer, which, by the way, was years ago, seriously, way before they sponsored us. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. You're Harry's OG. (laughs) Old school. Yeah, I I just love the idea. So how about you? 
Well, you know, I really love their shaving gel. I'm sensitive to stuff that's too perfumey, and their gel oh. has a great scent uh, that my lady digs, too. <laughs> your lady? You, you mean your wife? Yeah, I'm trying to be cool. Okay, yeah, that, that's not working. Maybe not, but Harry's is super cool. Talk about disrupting the marketplace. The guys that started it simply got fed up with overpriced razors filled with features you didn't even need. They knew that what you really had to have were great blades made with sharp, durable steel that lasts. That's why they bought their own factory that's been making the highest quality blades in the world for almost a hundred years, and you can instantly tell the minute you start to shave with a Harry's razor. Between owning the factory and selling directly to you over the internet, they can offer their blades at a much lower price when compared to the leading brand. Just $2 per blade compared to $4 or more. And here's the thing. They have a trial offer right now worth $13 that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. A weighted ergonomic handle, a five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. Our listeners can get all of that by redeeming their trial set at harrys.com slash legends. Yeah, folks, get an amazing shave and help support our show by going to harrys.com slash legends to redeem your offer. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Corey in Washington, D.C., and while I'm parsing big data, I enjoy listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. All right, there's one more picture. There's a lot of pictures from this place, and we keep talking about the website to check that out, 30eastdrive.com, which is also the place where you go if you want to go to the house and stay there. You can talk to them about that there, too. In fact, that's how I got in touch with Bill Bungie, the current owner of the house, who in turn put us in touch with the key holder of the house today, Carol. It's there for investigation teams, but private citizens like yourself, if you're uh, in the area, you can go visit. Yeah, I know we have a few listeners that grew up around there because they've been tweeting at us and sending That's us right. messages. So yeah. uh, head on over. Send us some pictures. <laughs> it's the, spend the night. I saw a meme recently. It might have been in our uh, fantastic Facebook group there, but uh, it was, you know, the person who's skeptical of ghosts has never spent a night in a haunted house. Yeah. <laughs> yet. And <laughs> it's a funny thing. It's just human nature, and I don't, I'm not mocking anybody, but it's just, you know, I have friends. It's it's like, well, that's all stupid. I don't believe in any of that. Like, oh, you want to go check out this? No, I'm no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, they'll, well, they'll come check it out with me. No, no. You know, like, okay. So, uh, you know, it's all, all that whistling through the graveyard we do. And, yeah. uh, you know, we all do it to some degree. So, uh, but it's just kind of funny. You can go on these and you can go uh, meet up with a paranormal investigation group if you want and uh, just see what happens. And, you know, most of the time from what we've heard, and uh, again, we're noobs at this. Uh, we're certainly not experienced, but uh, we know people who are. A lot of times nothing happens really of any importance or significance, but every once in a while something does and it makes you scratch your head. And then a smaller percentage of the time, something blows your socks off. Yeah, we'll talk about that in October. <laughs> socks. Uh, yes. I want to talk about uh, this photo before we move on to theories and kind of analysis. This particular picture, there's a lot of really amazing spooky pictures there. Like we said, you can find them over at the website for 30 East Drive. But there is one that's really fascinating to me. I'm going to read this excerpt from uh, Andy Evans' book. This is from pages 118 and 119 in the Kindle edition of Don't Look Back in Anger, The Black Monk of Pontefract. On one such visit, I was simply trying out a new camera, testing out its capabilities on various settings. One series of photographs immediately caught my eye when playing back the footage later that day at home. I had seemingly captured Glenn, who was the researcher that was with him, relaxing on a seat in the corner of the living room, immediately in front of the internal glazed double doors. One photograph depicts what looks like the figure of someone sitting on the reclining chair through the glass. The silhouette looks to be a man with arms aloft as if reading a broadsheet newspaper. The image reminded me of Sunday mornings when the man of the house would relax in his favorite chair perusing the week's news whilst waiting to get ready for a few pre-dinner pints at the local club. Was it possible the photograph had captured a scene from the past? East Drive was a puzzle and held its secrets tightly. So if you look at this picture, I've seen it. You can see sort of the frosty lace and you can clearly make out something sitting in the chair on the other side. Yeah. It looks like its arms are holding up uh, a book or a newspaper or something. And that's why they call it the reading man. Now we did not include this photograph in our little gallery for the, uh, the webpage for the episode for part two, but we encourage you to go to 30eastdrive.com and check out all the photos because there's several uh, different sets of them. So there's visitor photos, which you'll find uh, this one under that collection. There's also photos of the house and all kinds of good stuff. It's really pretty well put together, I think, and good documentation 
well laid out. So uh, it's pretty intriguing. But this one, yeah, you can see where the guy is sitting in a chair and uh, there's a door there. So there's kind of like frosted glass, I believe. And on the other side is the kitchen where there's also a chair. Then there is another angle, another shot on the other side of the door where it shows you where this thing would have been sitting, this entity. So in that photo, you see where the living human is sitting and the shadow on the other side of the French doors. And then the next shot shows you where this thing, this entity would have been sitting in the chair on the other side. And it's a little, it looks like a breakfast nook maybe that leads to the kitchen, right? Yeah, it seems that way. I haven't seen a floor plan of the house, but I know that the French doors are described as leading to the dining room and the kitchen. Right. And they're lockable. Right. And isn't that nearby where Philip saw some kind of hooded figure dissolve into the floor. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a lot of people who study this or, or, you know, mediums and psychics will say, the departed continue to do the things that they enjoyed in life. I guess I'll just be here in the studio. (laughs) I don't know. Are we enjoying this? It's time to talk a little bit about the theories behind this stuff. We're going to recap a little bit, but we talked about it in part one, the history of the area. I'm not going to go too deep on that. We did mention the bloody battle that took place at Pontefract Castle, which was eventually torn down. There were several battles there. And all of this stuff is pretty close to where the Checkerfield Estates are, which is where these council houses are. And that's what 30 East Drive is. It's a council house. One of the things that Colin Wilson talked about was how Jean Pritchard had said that one of her neighbors had found a book in the public library there suggesting that a Cluniac monk had been hanged for assaulting a young girl somewhere during the time of Henry VIII. This would be not too long before the Priory, which was founded in uh, 10... Henry VIII would have been the 1530s. Yeah, so, right. So and the, and the, yeah, the Priory so. came down in 1560 or something right. like that, right around there. So they were saying that this monk got convicted of this and he was hanged on these gallows, pretty much right in front of where 30 East Drive is. There's a little piece yeah. of land, if you look on Google Maps, there's a little walkway or street there in front of the house, and then there's a little island, like you find in any neighborhood, yeah, yeah. with trees. And there's a suggestion that that's where the gallows were, that this monk was hanged. A little bit of a knoll, the grassy knoll. There's a knoll there. Yeah, I don't know if it's a knoll. It's just a patch. I can't tell from Google Earth. Yeah, it's it's kind of a patch there. I couldn't remember seeing if they found this book, actually. They didn't find anything, and Wilson says that himself in his book. In fact, I'll quote him right here. Unfortunately for this fascinating theory, there is no evidence whatever that a monk of Pontefract was ever hanged for rape. He goes on to say, Pontefract is a small town and there are a few local histories there to be found in the reference section of the library where I spent a morning in August 1980. My search revealed that the local monks were involved in a great deal of litigation and a certain amount of violence. Their virtues were warlike rather than contemplative, but there was undoubtedly no rape and murder. Perhaps a neighbor had read the story of the hanging of a vicar called George Beaumont in the time of the Civil War when the parliamentarians were besieging the royalists in Pontefract Castle. He was accused of carrying on a correspondence with the royalists. He, as far as I can see, is the only priest to have been hanged in the area. That's from a Kindle location 2059 to 2064 in Colin Wilson's book, Poltergeist, A Classic Study in Destructive Hauntings. So Colin Wilson's saying right there, I couldn't find anything to back this up. And there was an, an investigator whose name was uh, Tim Kuniff, C-U-N-I-F-F, mm-hmm. who was the one that was also supporting this theory of this monk. And it's my understanding that that's what people grew to think that lived in the house. But you get into this whole thing, especially when you get to these hauntings where everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. They want to yeah. label it. They want to corral it and compartmentalize exactly. it. So they're saying, oh, well, this must be what this is. And then when you get to where you're trying to understand the nature of a haunting, if you believe any of this at all, maybe it's all <laughs> a big hoax. But if you are trying to understand the mm-hmm. nature of it, is the haunting then, because it's not what you think it is at all, but it's grasping for whatever frightens you, is it then conforming to what you're suggesting that it is? Does yeah. it become the black monk, the horrible well, oh. child assaulting monk that was hanged for his crimes? Does yeah. it become that? Or... Does it exist? Or as someone else said in one of these, I can't even remember where I read this source, if that had happened, it probably wouldn't have been necessarily recorded. Aside from the hanging, because people would want vengeance, maybe that might have been mentioned if you had some sort of form of media, but you might not put it down on the books. Uh, That's plausible. One of our monks did this. Let's maybe this file, let's put this in the trash. <laughs> that happens so, all the time. Yeah. It's no, recently. It, yeah. Well, uh, it, Actually, it they kept all today. their files. They kept yeah. all their files, but they didn't tell anybody about it. It's so hard to say, but it's a good question because one, it's so long ago, nobody really knows. Two, my question is, does it really matter what really went on? 
does this have to be a one-to-one correlation to something that happened in the past to something that's happening now or an echo of it or somebody, you know, a convicted murderer who is uh, out for vengeance, whatever this is, does that matter or could it have been something generated organically from some kind of raw energy? So, well, yeah, these are, I mean, like, I'm sorry, it was leading up to an answer. I don't know, of course, but I think what we're seeing here is that it's a, there's several things going on. Yeah, well, and Collins had said in his book that he believed them. He said, quote, what struck me most strongly was the spontaneity of the whole thing. They might contradict one another. No, it wasn't that day. It was the day when Alan Williams came because you remember he put his hat down on that chair and it disappeared, end quote. But they were obviously discussing something they had all lived through. So his point was when he was gathering all the stories from the actual family, and he's the only person that interviewed them, Right. they were telling the same stories. They might disagree about details. It's like your favorite thing that you've said in a few shows, I was hit by a red truck. And it's like, well, you know what? It wasn't a red truck. But no, but it was a truck. We can safely say that I was hit by a truck. No, I know. That's the uh, baby in the bathwater argument against all all eyewitness testimony is right. that it's all fallible. It's all You can't uh, trust any of it because they got the color of the truck wrong. And so we hear this argument a lot. And nothing against the people that say it. It's a uh, easy thing to go to. That's not a slight either. I'm just saying to say that uh, eyewitness testimony is often fallible. Well, that's true. So do we get rid of all of it? Should that be gone from our judicial system? Because as far as I know, testimony counts for a lot. And so does eyewitness testimony. So like you said, you just have to examine the context and do the best, you know, with what you can. That's the evidence. So well, you're getting so dogmatic that you're yeah. getting caught up in, you know, it's everything right. is black and white. But if the spiritual world is connected to humanity yeah. in any way, there is no black and white. There well, is gray. It's a combination of yeah. events and circumstances and different types of evidence. Yeah. And some of these legends that you come across or that we've come across in our show may in fact be a combination of a real event and a hoax. They may, yeah. it may all work together. Does that mean that the experiencer didn't fake a bunch of stuff that happened later? No, it works right. both ways. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. It may have been a once in a lifetime event and that might not be enough for that person. Yeah. So we're just trying to encourage everyone to keep an open mind and think about the nature of people it's, and what they are experiencing. Yeah. Look at everything. Look at all the stuff. And so well, why not consider everything? Then categorize the things that you think are more likely. But to, at the offset, discount some stuff just because it doesn't agree with you and you don't think it makes sense, well, we all differ on that. If somebody sees somebody commit a crime, it's like, well, there's no witnesses other than this one person. It's like, eh, eyewitness testimony. Usually pretty fallible. Do not investigate the case. Do you let that guy go? Right. Because it's like, well, it's just one guy. Maybe a thousand people saw it. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. That's just human nature not to believe that because it's easier not to get into that crazy territory Let's just keep things simple and not check things out that bother us. And I say, let's get bothered. We said at the top of the show, we were going to talk about these definitions, the differences. Ah, yes, yeah. the differences between poltergeists, ghosts, and demons, if there are any. And of course, we think there are, if you believe any of this at well, all. Well, <laughs> you said something kind of funny because it was Scott's task to kind of look up some simple definitions we can quickly go over. Thank you for giving me this simple task. Uh, it wasn't. No, I just said. No, no, no. It was well, you, I asked him, well, it's like, do you know the difference? Like, what, do you, what did you find? Because he was doing a lot of the uh, research in this area. And he was like, I don't know, not much. <laughs> but he had a definition, <laughs> which is like, correct me if I'm wrong. Poltergeists can be ghosts. Not all ghosts are poltergeists. Yeah, no, wait, here's how it goes. Not all ghosts are poltergeists, but all poltergeists are ghosts. <laughs> what the? And really? yeah. a demon, I think, is neither a ghost nor a poltergeist. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That's where I'm coming down. Okay. And I've got to say, I was surprised when I Googled for some good old-fashioned cursory research, uh -huh. poltergeist versus ghost versus demons, I didn't get a whole lot of good stuff. And yeah. I even tried just poltergeist versus ghosts, and a few things came back. I actually had to spend a little time reading lots of different sources <laughs> to uh, come yeah. to a conclusion. Uh, people don't necessarily agree about poltergeist and ghosts. Everyone agrees what a demon is. It's got all that biblical <laughs> knowledge to back it up. Well, that's interesting you say that. One, that explanation you just gave, to me, sounds a lot like Newman describing uh, certified mail versus registered mail on <laughs> Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> all certified mail is registered, all, whatever it was. Like, yeah. not all registered mail is certified, or vice, I think it's vice versa, but uh, <laughs> ask your local postal carrier. The idea, though, is that it falls into these groups, and you just mentioned the second thing here, more seriously, is that you said biblical. Yes. There are a lot of mediums who are not Christian. Some are 
pagan. Some classify themselves as uh, as witches. Some come from different backgrounds, and also just general main religions. You could be Hindu, you could be Muslim. I don't know how they view these kinds of things individually, but of course we know from uh, the Arabic world, the jinn. Yeah, the jinn, uh, I was going to say. A, I know a little bit, because we have, we have lots of Muslim listeners, and in, including one longtime Islamic listener, Fawaz, who is yeah. oh, the yeah, first yeah. time I sent a hat to... Uh, <laughs> To the Middle East. Oh, that's cool. But he yeah. was just DMing me on Twitter a few days ago about the jinn. Oh, and, the, yes, which we've yeah. been wanting to do a story on. No, no, it's its own thing. And uh, from what I know cursorily, that there can be a demonic type element to that, but they're very powerful. So there's all these classifications, again. So depending on who you ask, like you said, there are these different classes of spiritual elemental beings, all the way from uh, things that could just be a negative ball of energy some things that are sentient or consciousness, some things that are human. Yeah, I've heard so many definitions, but it depends on who you ask. So that was a good point, like what you're talking about here. Sure. And I don't think we totally know, as we'll see here in a, a little bit when we go to read some of these definitions and a few things that the Ark has dug up, that poltergeists are generally viewed one way, but as I said in part one, now that thinking has maybe changed. Demons and demonologists will classify those spirits in a different way. So again, it's all over the map. And we're back to square one where you're going to have to go with your gut on this. One of the things that you do find out when you read about poltergeist is, well, first of all, people think the very idea of it, obviously it involves kinetic movement, kinetic energy. And then of course, what ensues is the idea of psychokinesis or um, yeah. psychokinetic energy and mm -hmm. the idea that you can use your mind to move something. Or yeah. that, and so there are people who will tell you that it has nothing to do with the dead, that it's some kind of manifestation of usually a living adolescent girl and in some cases an adolescent boy. Right. Although I read one article just today that said poltergeists have manifested with people as old as 78. So <laughs> I don't think that happens a lot. Yeah. And Well, I'll say there are rules in some general sense, but they don't follow your rules of reason. Yeah. There's no categorization. It's like, ooh, 49 and younger, I'm sorry. You're a little too old. Right. And when I said not all ghosts are poltergeists, but all poltergeists are ghosts, actually that really isn't a good definition because yeah. it discounts the idea that it has nothing to do with the afterlife, which is what a lot of people believe when it comes to poltergeists. And then there's a whole other camp of people that believe every single poltergeist and every story of a poltergeist right is the prank of usually adolescent children involved in the scenario because they're always present. That's a good angle on that. Yeah, that's what a lot of skeptics will tell you. Right. And if you take a look at the infield poltergeist, which you made an allusion to earlier, a lot of people seem to think that Janet, the girl in that story, there were two sisters, but she was the one that they thought was faking that's a lot right. of stuff. That's right, Margaret or the other one? Yes, yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. There is all that going on too. Of course, we'll remind you that in the case of the Black Monk of Pontefract, the first report of things that happened happened when Philip was home. And not only that, according to Philip and his grandmother, he was all the way out in the backyard when stuff right. started. Right. And then the rest of the family came home and was like, what? That didn't happen. And yeah. then all the ensuing stuff began to attack Diane. Then on top of that, the neighbor, if you look at Mrs. Mountain, she didn't have kids. She had kids that visited, yeah. but they didn't live with her. And she was seeing things next door. And so the question is... I don't know what hoaxer, if Diane and Philip were both hoaxing what was happening on 30 East Drive, I don't know how they made a black monk manifest in the neighbor's kitchen. Yeah, right. So you've got to take the big picture. Like I said, it's a gray area, or in this case, a black blobbish area. <laughs> Dude, but um, yeah. that all comes back around to, you know, poltergeist versus ghosts. And, you know, I found all these lists where, like, a ghost can be interactive. It's a deceased person. Right. Uh, it's an echo of a former, or it's someone that's like, it's your mom. You can see her in the corner of the living yeah. room, you know, and that sort of thing. And then there's these things that throw your food around and yeah. try to break your eggs. Or move your furniture, just right. like the movie. And then the demon's a whole nother ball of wax. Yeah, and then uh, there are some people who, uh, I believe some mediums that do not believe in demons at all. Right. Uh, it's a different negative form of energy because they're not of the Judeo-Christian Right, angle. because they're either agnostic or they don't believe in, in that particular right, but they, but theology. They do, but they all believe in a spiritual side, of course, because uh, you have to believe in something because you're getting this from somewhere. Right, you know? for them it translates more as just pure evil. And then a lot of things uh, they would say that are not totally even evil that we're mischaracterizing them because of our predilections for certain belief systems. So it's just a myriad of stuff. That's the one thing that we always keep coming back to is that there are so many things going on with each of these cases and even with, I think, people who have an insight to this, mediums and researchers and, and psychics, 
I don't know if you're seeing everything as well. And I think a lot of them would say like, well, no, I would have to be there. That's interesting in itself is that you see glimpses, but it's not like this is a film that people can point to and have you watch. And then you, it's like a documentary. It's like, oh, you got it now. You know, again, it's a murky place, the other side of the veil. So there are, I guess, some definitions you can wrap around and some characteristics you can put a name to and classify it that way. And, and so, yeah, if you do some study in this field that you'll find there are some things that stick. So when you talk about poltergeist activity, well, look, applying these rules then, the Fred or the Black Mug or Mr. Nobody seems to have a consciousness, some sentience, because it's not just flinging things around, it's playing jokes. If you take all these categories... It's reactionary. So, yeah, if you take all these things to be real, as they're explained, then it's reactionary, it has a sense of humor, jerky one, but it's not just, you know what I'm saying, breaking stuff, throwing things off the wall, or tipping things over. It does that as well, but it's like with the upside down crosses, the mocking with the gloves, the eggs, all, it's showing off. It's making a statement, that's the point, and that only a consciousness or something that's sentient does that rather than just raw power. So now here's a definition I want to get to before, uh, and you asked me this. this oh yes, the this difference up. between paranormal and supernatural. Yes, and uh, this is just for Rich Adam here because he pointed this out on Twitter that I didn't want to explain it, and then it's like, ah, eh, crud, you know, I better say something. It's interesting, and again, I don't know what the accepted definition is in even the parapsychological realm or profession, but I found this on knowledgenuts.com. So that's just knowledge exactly, nuts. yeah. The off-sided knowledge nuts. No, well, you know what? I think I saw, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned them before, and I can't remember what episode, but I yeah. just came up before. So I think this is a pretty good definition, simplified, that I can understand myself, <laughs> that uh, is okay to share. And maybe Rich uh, will get this, and I'll redeem myself in his eyes. You know, because it's knowledge nuts, N-U-T-S, dot com. At the top is, in a nutshell, the terms paranormal, quote unquote, and supernatural, quote unquote, are often tossed around to mean the same thing, something we don't understand. They're actually two separate terms, though. Paranormal refers to something that's not understood by current scientific knowledge. There's the potential that something paranormal will someday be explained scientifically, and there's a likelihood there's a good natural explanation for it. Supernatural refers to a phenomenon that is beyond our capability to understand, now and simply forever, because it just doesn't operate under our rules. Nice. There you go. I like that. I, I think I kind of got close to that <laughs> the last time I tried to explain that. I just remembered that off the top of my head. I thought, like, okay, well, I don't know what field uh, would make a differentiation in, uh, on those two terms, but there's, it makes sense to me. There's a little fuzz, though, between yeah. the two. Because here's well, what I will say. Yeah. Here's the fuzzy line for me. Okay. It sounds like the bar between paranormal and supernatural might be sliding around based on your ability to comprehend. So, for example, if you take a look at it, you know, and I often refer to the movie Interstellar, you see, mm -hmm. and it, you're trying to understand what's happening. Spoiler alert! But when, when he's, oh, he's yeah, getting right. communications from himself, essentially from another place in time and space, mm -hmm. and until he understands how that all works. That for him is supernatural, but then it crosses over to paranormal for you, the viewer, by the right. time you get to the end of the movie, it becomes completely plausible. So to me, this definition talks about two different things that can't be, but I think there are levels of knowledge and levels of physics, whether you're talking about spooky action at a distance or any of that quantum theory right. stuff, a lot of which can be quantified. There's a point at which... There has to be science that is so far outside the realm of our comprehension that if something happened, it would appear to be supernatural, when in fact, it really is paranormal. We're just 100 years away from even beginning to wrap our heads around it. Does that, was what I'm saying? Making yeah, sense? no, I, I know what you're getting at yeah. here. It's a little like entanglement theory. It or, is entanglement. That's well, that is a, the yeah, official that's term <laughs> for spooky action. I prefer spooky action, well, but hey. Hey, so does uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. And in that course he gives uh, at the uh, Great Courses Plus, our spooky universe, because these things look like magic, but there's an explanation for it. We're heading towards it. And that is my point with this. Some of this stuff, you're right. I think if we have more evidence, we have more scientific knowledge about it, we may explain some of it, even some of the stuff that seems to be on the supernatural side, like ghosts. We were talking before, and actually there's been a lot of discussion here, even in the arc, about what I said, I think in part one, about the temperature of the void. 
you know, we had a chat between Roger and Jill Pingleton and uh, Ella in the art made a mention of this too. So uh, I it inspired some fury or something or just discussion, I hope. But the idea is that there are several theories out there. And again, this is stuff that may get to a scientific explanation, but what these things are doing is drawing heat, energy from the space that they're in currently, which makes it seem cold that really, in theory, there is no such thing as, you know, it's always absolute zero, I guess, is a way to explain that. We generate heat due to entropy. Boy, I'm explaining this really terribly. But, <laughs> but the idea is that why you feel cold is because this thing to create action and to be to have a presence in our realm is drawing heat. Brought to you by the Mediocre Courses Minus. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, hey, there's an old uh, trucker cap. If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with BS. There yeah. You go. Okay. So, you know, the idea is that uh, that's one theory. You know, the discussion uh, in our text chain and again, it got kind of, uh, these people are pretty smart, Jill and Rogers. So uh, <laughs> it was kind of hard for us to boil this down into uh, 10 seconds of thought here. But the idea is that maybe it's a portal thing. You're getting some kind of tunnel. We don't know. These are all fun things to think about. Maybe one day physicists will be able to figure out one element of this if we get enough evidence and data. Now, will they want to? Probably not. Because as we've said before with this stuff, to most serious scientists, it's not worth checking. Well, into. you know what though, they are looking at very hard at entanglement yeah. and trying to figure oh, that, it out. Yes, and, and that is. Listen, yeah, yeah. listen to this. Uh, this is the first sentence of an article I found on it just while we were talking earlier. This is from ScienceMagazine.org, an article published April twenty fifth, two thousand eighteen, by Gabriel Popkin. Just listen to the first sentence. One of the strangest aspects of quantum physics is entanglement. If you observe a particle in one place, another particle, even one light years away will instantly change its properties as if the two are connected by a mysterious communication channel. There you go. Yeah, they're working on that. Yeah. So that right there, mm -hmm. if you were to observe that and not really understand when, mm -hmm. when we don't really understand it. Right, not the, fully, that, sure. Is this science looking at something that is paranormal? That's what I'm saying. So that's kind of the definition there. Does this apply to eggs and opera gloves yeah. and keys and all these things and porcelain kitties? Is it magic? Well, some people would say none of that's happening anyway, so that can't be possible. We just don't know. Well, we don't know yet. The other thing that this talks about is how the properties are defined by when you observe it. And that's, oh, sure, the, that's sure. the yeah. most mysterious Schrodinger's thing. Schrodinger's cat and all that. Yeah, yeah, Schrodinger's cat, exactly. And that's the part that I want to say to the skeptics who, there's a part of me that begins to wonder if by the nature of how you intend to observe something or what you believe that you are shut out of the process of ever perceiving something unexplainable. Right. Because for you, it only exists this one way. You're making your own reality. And for people who do believe, they're seeing things just as real that are unexplainable because yeah. that's their reality. And everyone's creating their own reality and the two sides can never meet. It's like far left versus far right. There's no discussion to be had there yeah. because we're living in different worlds and we can't get to the middle. It's very, it's very interesting. No, uh, yeah, absolutely. But because I'm digressing like crazy. <laughs> well, we're still on the same track here because uh, as far as these definitions are concerned, I think here it's germane to the conversation because is what was and is happening at 30 East Drive, is that explainable in a paranormal way or is this something spiritual that we will never understand? That's the basic argument here. So to, again, here's a good example I, I heard to kind of make a differentiation here. Sasquatch or Bigfoot might fall under the paranormal realm, because think about it, it might be just a heretofore unknown animal that we just don't know about. It's an ape thing. It's not a half ape, half man. It doesn't wear shirts. It might smoke. I don't know. If you left a cigar out, it might do that. It's a natural thing, just really weird and not supposed to be in the places that we see it. We talked about this before with the Yeti. Gigantopithecus blackie, Black eye. I never looked that up. I don't know if it's it's the eye at the B L A C K I. <laughs> I know, I know, I know yeah. what the Latin is. The the correct uh, pronunciation on that ending there is was a three meter tall ape. 
they've extrapolated that from a jawbone, a piece of jawbone. So it's monstrous. It's like King Kong. It's just, you know, it shouldn't exist. A nine foot tall ape in the North American woods should not be there. But apes like that of that size existed. So we don't know. Again, there's a lot of factors there, but that's more paranormal because he's a cryptid or a UFO even. What I would say is that the traditional view is that this is some kind of a machine. I do believe that uh, governments and militaries do have advanced machinery flying around out there, but it's a machine. It's not a ghost. So it's just unknown. It might fly by properties that are unknown to the general public and general aviation and even most of military aviation. But again, these are scientific properties. On the other hand, something supernatural might be a ghost or better yet, a skinwalker. Because that would be supernatural because you might be able to capture evidence of both. And even with a ghost, like I said, it's the ghost in the jar principle. If you were able to capture it, that's how a lot of people would finally maybe even believe that it's possible. But it's unlikely that science would ever be able to explain it. You know, a ghost... Maybe. Like I said, there are principles where it gets colder. If you could duplicate that, I don't think they're going to cooperate. But if you can have a ghost repeat something at will to perform your tricks, maybe you could record some of that phenomenon and finally figure out what's going on there. The skinwalker, that's not supposed to be possible. Hey, Force, you know what one of my favorite new sponsors of Astonishing Legends is? Uh, what's that? Bomba Socks. Oh, yeah, no, I can see why, man. They're up there with some of the best product samples we've ever gotten. They truly are. I'm particularly rough on socks, especially <laughs> at home where I tend to use them as house slippers. Yeah. And with Bombas, it's even easier to do that because they're both super comfortable and seemingly indestructible. And that's saying something because I even wear them outside when I got to like run some recycling to the curb and stuff. No, I, I'm really not behind that. Hey, man, I'm doing my <laughs> part to help the planet. No, I mean, with recycling, sure. But what does wearing your socks outside have to do with that? Well, Bombas is a pretty amazing company. They're actually a certified B corporation, which means they've achieved higher standards of social and environmental performance, transparency, and accountability. It's like what fair trade certification is to a coffee producer. B Corps are committed to using business as a force for good in the world, and that's something that I'm actually really into. Yeah, I didn't know that about them, but I did know that they were doing good in the world, because they've donated a pair of new socks to those in need for every pair they've sold. And that's over 9 million pairs of new socks donated so far. So when you think about the fact that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters, you can see why that's such a great cause. That alone would be enough to warrant buying Bombas socks, but they're also incredibly well-made and amazingly comfortable too. They use super soft, breathable cotton with built-in arch support that hugs your foot, a cushioned footbed, and my favorite, a seamless toe, which gets rid of that annoying bump on your toes that has plagued humanity <laughs> since the first caveman put a sock on. Yeah, I don't know about using caveman as a reference. That doesn't, uh, that's not uh, factual. Forrest and I both wear Bombas socks every day now, and I've gotten them in every style available, from ankle to casual to dress, and I love them all. We know you'll like them too, so take advantage of this offer for our listeners today by getting 20% off your first order. Just go to bombas.com slash A-L. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash A-L, and then enter the code AL at checkout. Help folks in need and support the show by getting some outstanding new socks today when you visit bombas.com slash AL and use the code AL at checkout to get 20% off your first order. I'm Chris Star Marie, and when I'm not knitting sweaters for cryptoids, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. All right, well, we can't do this series without talking a little bit about RSPK, which is Repetitive Spontaneous Psychokinesis, which actually some people just abbreviate RSP, which from an acronym standpoint would be more correct because the K mm -hmm. is part of psychokinesis, <laughs> one word, so yeah. it should just be RSP, but RSPK. And this is something that people have used to describe poltergeist. Specifically, there was a parapsychologist named W.G. Roll who mm -hmm. used this to uh, create a definition for poltergeist phenomena. The thing about RSPK and, again, psychokinetic activity in general is that skeptics have a field day with it. For them, as I said earlier in the show, it's always a hoax. It's people pretending to bend spoons and they're just using their thumb, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't read the book on Uri Geller. I do yeah, want to right. read it. But, uh, Don't or, ask James Randi what he, what he thinks. Yeah, yeah. or okay. exactly that situation or kids throwing things and then a picture gets snapped or they're jumping way up in the air and the picture snapped and everyone says they're mm -hmm. levitating, which goes to the Enfield poltergeist story. So there's a lot of that possibility there. And uh, important thing to note about the Black Monk of Pontifract is we, we don't have 
contemporaneous with the original story, mm-hmm. we don't have evidence. We don't have a lot of pay. All we have is what people said and what eyewitnesses said. And we get back to that whole thing about eyewitnesses. Even though we make our argument that you need to listen to some parts of eyewitness testimony, maybe, even if you're not going to listen to all of it. But I think that when you look at RSP or RSPK and how it describes a poltergeist phenomena, The way that it works is, that's the thing I was talking about earlier, where it's not a ghost, it's not a demon, it's not even a poltergeist, really. It's actual, because poltergeist means noisy ghost. Right. What it is, instead of that, is a manifestation of energy created usually by an adolescent child, which is usually a female, and I'm not trying to vilify. No, 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 that's that's, that's that's established. That's established as a theory about how poltergeists work. And this has nothing to do with anything being dead. What it has to do with is this massive power, this energy that can exist outside of your body and levitate and move and throw things. Yeah. And that's uh, really what it comes down to. Madame Kuligina, I think, uh, from Russia. Remember, she was famous, I think, in the 50s. uh, Yes. Supposedly could claim to affect things and move things uh, with uh, telekinesis. Right. What's funny, there are levels to this kind of craziness. (laughs) There's... I think there would be some people who who would say like, okay, yeah, maybe there's thought energy. You know, we generate electricity. If you watch The Matrix, you know about that, (laughs) Copper Top, and that's a fact. And so maybe this energy could be manifested and directed in a way that it affects solid objects. Okay, that's one level, but that's too much for a lot of people. That can't happen. It's all baloney. There's fishing line involved. The second part of that is that, okay, so it's not just a person. This is coming from some disembodied entity that has a connection to a human being or something. You know, there's all these variations and uh, you can pick which one where your jumping off point is like, okay, that's too crazy. Yeah. And what's funny, there are levels to that, even with uh, the people who study the most way out stuff. I heard Rob Gerstofferson, our friend and ARC member, interview John E.L. Tenney author and an investigator into all, all kinds of weird stuff. He would say he's the, he, he just, he's all about the weird. And, uh, we got to have him on at some point. He, just to, yeah, we're just friends a, with him on Twitter. And yeah, Facebook. great. No, no, yeah, he, yeah, it was, yeah, uh, it was on. great. And, uh, it was a really interesting interview. So he had some great insights as well. One, I remember him talking about this very thing is that you talk to these investigators who study the most way out crazy stuff you could think of like uh, alien human hybrids and, mutilations and secret bases and stuff and they have points where it's like no okay that's crazy (laughs) i'm down with the alien human hybrids but the spiritual things demons no that's crazy he had another good point he was at a conference and and one of the things he does is ask people like okay how many here raise your hand how many people here believe in ufos and a lot of people raise their hands how many people here believe in ghosts and a lot of you know maybe not some of the same people but a lot of people raise their hands how many people here believe in sasquatch the fewest number, a yeah. very small number. And he said, that's the thing that makes possibly the most sense of right. existing. <laughs> it's, right. just, it's just an animal. Right. Maybe if you believe in it, that is the thing that people are least likely to believe in. And it doesn't make sense, does well, you, it? No. And you, you know what Stephen Wright used to say, the yeah. comedian? All those who believe in psychokinesis, raise my right hand. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the point about this is that no matter your definitions, they're all still very personal. How you kind of assess a weird situation like this. And I think it's still going to be different no matter what you're thinking until you actually go experience this for yourself because it's just unexplainable. All right. Well, so let's get now down to the resurrection Mary of it all. You know, now we're kind of thinking about uh, intellectually about what this might be. And so this is looking at the black monk, maybe more as folklore, but also the idea of the black monk, not so much the evidence and what it's done or the stories of abuse and ridicule it is foisted upon these people. But if you look at the black monk as an archetype, much like the lady in white or Resurrection Mary or La Llorona or the hat man or the old hag, we've talked about this a lot before. So it's the archetype. And just as a refresher, here's how dictionary.com defines archetype. It's a noun, for one. The first definition, number one, is the original pattern or model from which all things of the same kind are copied or on which they are based. A model or first form. Prototype. Now, here's where it gets fun. Definition number two, in Jungian psychology, a collectively inherited unconscious idea, pattern or thought, image, etc., universally present in individual psyches, So now we're starting with definition two there. We're starting to get towards what a black monk character or 
La Llorona or uh, the Old Hag might be, which are, are seen around the world, except that the Black Monk is a little bit different. It has all the, a lot of these similarities, like why does it appear so often? Why is it in such a, a myth and folklore? Why is it everywhere? Or is it? And does it appear around the world? Well, Quade Jocelyn from the Ark uh, was thinking, as we were, that the figure of the dark shadow wearing a hood, a robe, a hooded robe, and uh, he found some anecdotes and accounts uh, where this image has appeared. So he was uh, thinking about that. This pops up in stories, this kind of image. And then Marissa Ball, also from the Ark, found an interesting passage from what looks like an awesome reference book. Actually, I think we just bought two copies of this. We did. <laughs> they will have them in a few days. Chambers Dictionary of the Unexplained in hardcover from December 19th, 2007 by Una McGovern. She's the editor on that. And yes, uh, go uh, ahead and insert your joke here. Uh, yes, and it comes from the same publishing house as the Tobin Spirit Guy. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's right. That's one of our favorites. Uh, that does not exist. This does. Well, as Marissa was saying, and according to this passage, the figure of the black monk may be far more common and unique to Britain than anywhere else. So right there, this archetype is a little different than the lady in white or the old hag which appear all over the world, which that's why I wanted to uh, study that as much as we did, because it started to blow my mind, like, she's everywhere. Yeah, why? Yeah. Why this image? Well, to reiterate here, the Black Monk is a very common image, and he ends up in myth and folklore from uh, way, way back when, the yeah. earliest writings, and especially in the Middle Ages. There are some very similar elements going on. So I wanted to read the passage that uh, Marissa took from this, uh, the Black Monk chapter out of this Chambers Dictionary as a reference here. Quote, archetypical form of hooded apparition, hooded apparitions falling within the type generally described as, quote, Black Monk, appear in reports from locations throughout Britain. They are also a common feature of numerous folk stories and legends. A hooded figure with a skeletal face is said to haunt Beacon Hill at Woodhouse Eaves, and Leicestershire, a monk in black was said to walk the route of a secret tunnel at Binham in Norfolk, and a black monk apparition known as the Goblin Friar was said to act as a harbinger of disaster to the Byron family at Newstead Abbey in Nottinghamshire. The poet Lord Byron referred to the specter in his poem, Don Juan, and that poem's from 1819 to around 1824, and was even said to have seen it himself before his ill-fated marriage to Anne Milbank in 1816. Many more examples could also be listed. Originally, it was considered that such apparitions were simply the ghosts of deceased monks, who in their lives had been attached to one of the many monastic sites that existed in England and Wales until the Reformation. This view has now been challenged by the idea that, in at least some cases, the black monk figure is better understood as an archetypal figure linked with particular landscapes. If so, the black monk may have more in common with other symbolic apparitions, such as the white lady and the black dog, rather than resulting from manifestations connected with deceased individuals. There are also rare examples of hooded forms connected with poltergeist outbreaks, Notably, the so-called Black Monk of Pontefract case in 1966, in which the well-witnessed disturbances were attributed to the ghost of a monk from a Cluniac monastery who was supposedly executed in the reign of Henry VIII. In parentheses here, although this theory was rejected by Colin Wilson, who reviewed the case in 1980. Although the Black Monk is a common ghost motif in Britain, it is much rarer in other European countries, particularly in those that didn't embrace Protestantism and remained mainly Catholic. It is also known in Latin American countries, but does not appear in folklore or reports of hauntings from the USA. Again, that citation is from the entry for the Black Monk in the book Chambers Dictionary of the Unexplained, edited by Una McGovern. So, pretty interesting points brought up in this article, in this passage here. But what are the main points? Well, I'll start by saying, like, the hood, I think, is a common icon and a powerful image. Even today, it evokes mystery, concealment, disguise, and, unfortunately, crime in some cases, when it should be used for its original purpose to keep your head warm. Remember the black ski mask uh, with the eye and mouth holes? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, people over 40 will know uh, what I'm talking about. It was to the 1970s and 80s what the hoodie is to 21st century criminals. Not saying everyone wearing a hoodie is a criminal, of course, but it is a convenient disguise for criminals because they're, they're already wearing it. And please don't commit any crimes while you're wearing our new hoodies. <laughs> so just had to throw that out there. The other one was, uh, that's weird. Remember the, um, the lady stalking a lot of uh, criminals in the 70s 
and the early 80s would pull a lady's stocking over their face and it makes your face really grotesque. And Raising Arizona, it. son, you got a panty on your head. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> so thank goodness uh, specters aren't doing that because it'd be even more frightening. That and the clear Halloween mask. Yeah. Remember when we were talking about shadow people a couple of Halloweens ago uh, and how in the Middle Ages... What we think of today as shadow people and the hat man were called the black monks or shadow monks back then. So did they change their dress to the times to fit our contemporary mindsets, people of the day, or do we imagine them differently with the times? Now, getting back to the article, as we said before, it may be easier for people to think of a ghost as the spirit of a deceased human being, like the black monk or Fred being the ghost of a 16th century monk. That we can handle somewhat unless you don't believe in a spirit world, and then all of this is humbug. But the idea is that other types of supernatural entities, like what some investigators and researchers and mediums will call elementals or lower spiritual life forms, you know, disembodied consciousness, or dark blobs of negative energy, and even up to demons, they're too scary and abstract for most of us to want to deal with. So yeah. it's easier to say, like, that's the ghost of that monk who uh, killed a bunch of kids. Right. That's right. much more I need to easy. label it. It's the need... For cognitive closure. That makes more sense to us because that's, that's an a owl. human. I hate to bring the owls up again. <laughs> People got real sick of that. But oh. yeah, it's you, I'm going to label this and now I can put it away. Right. And so that's the thing. Yeah, owls can, uh, they can punch holes in your scalp. They can attack you. Uh, generally, they don't if you leave them alone. But we can understand owls. Space goblins, not so much. So it's much easier for us to say, and again, it's make a, a connection to history to say like, oh, we know who this is. It's like finding out the name of a demon, if you're into demonology. It's like, then you have some power over it because you know what you're dealing with. There are certain uh, aspects of it that are more tenable. So you can have some control over this. And when you don't, that really upsets us. When you don't know what this thing is, is it Fred? Is it multiple black monks? That's what's scary to us. So as the article said, the black monk may be less of the image of the ghost of a deceased monk and more like an image of a being, you know, thought form, entity, whatever it is, that is more tied to the land there, the property, the house, or the people who step onto that landscape. You get that idea. Yeah, Is that totally. it's that place, whatever that was, and that maybe goes back to the, uh, the priory there of the monks, that it's more tied to that than actually the people or a well, ghost of a person. Well, that's I heard a long time ago, that those things are connected to the earth and not even the structures on them, unless the structure happens to be a thousand years old. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It could, that's what I'm saying. So that's another idea. So we're back to the chicken and egg principle here, the idea of what this thing might be. Are people seeing a black mass that they have come to imagine as a black monk because it was once a black monk, and that's kind of what it looked like? Or did the image of a black monk take its form because that's the legend people have been telling each other about? So it's kind of like a tulpa. Okay, that's the story we're going with. That makes sense. And from that Jungian definition, from the collective consciousness, this thing has taken shape and image because that's the story we're mostly going with. So this thing, Fred, appears to people because that's a form people can understand and accept. You know what I'm saying? That's why she named it. Fred. Yeah. You get Fred. I get Fred. Yeah, he's a jerk, but, you know, he's around all the time. And, you know, sometimes he does funny things pokes fun at Aunt Maud. Mostly he makes a mess, which is not appreciated, but it's that annoying relative. It's the friend of the friend who's like, a, oh, God, he's over again. All right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's Newman. He's That's really, what, he's the thing that wouldn't leave. <laughs> it's Kramer's friend, <laughs> Newman. Yeah. And, and it's Newman and Jerry like, hello, Newman. You know, it's just, he's there and he's just kind of always around. You just accept it, you know? So that's kind of an easier thing to accept. But could it be a combination of, of a bunch of things? Is it Fred or whatever the main trickster spirit is, reading people's minds and taking clues from that? Philip the Sun, as we said before, uh, seemed to think it knew his next move before he did. So is that just a manifestation of psychokinetic energy? Then it's even that's kind of crazy if, if it's Diane's or Philip's subconscious doing things that make it seem like it's omniscient. That's pretty way out there in itself. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's kind of where I end up with this. In summation of all these activities we've heard about for parts one and two and, and uh, three now, what do you think that this thing is? Is it one thing? Is it many things? Is it one thing controlling several other things? Because there does seem to be one course of action, you know what I'm saying? Like one thing that has, uh, that is consistent in its actions. Yeah. Until it got kind of violent. 
And then it, it got kind of weird. I mean, even weirder. All right, we're going to do a little bit of an unconventional structure tonight where we're going to talk about some conclusions and analysis, and then we're going to play a soundbite from our interview with Carol Fieldhouse, the current caretaker of 30 East Drive. You'll get to hear from somebody who's actually been there quite a lot. Yeah, she's over there daily and was in the connected house at number 79 when we spoke to her. So uh, that's coming up after this. There's two things I wanted to share on this. I wanted to share two prominent points of view in terms of their conclusions. One is the conclusion of a British writer who was known for his work in parapsychology, a guy named Guy Playfair. And uh, Guy Playfair's explanation was actually shared by Colin Wilson in his book when he went to meet with him briefly about this case. Colin says, I had been corresponding with Playfair for some time. We discussed the view expressed in The Flying Cow that a poltergeist is basically a mischievous, disembodied spirit. I was inclined to be skeptical. Guy explained his own notion of the nature of the poltergeist. Quote, it's a kind of football, a football of energy. It somehow gets exuded from disturbed teenagers at puberty. Along come two or three spirits, or elementals, they look through this window, and they see the football lying around, and they do what any group of schoolboys would do. They go and kick it around, smashing windows and generally creating havoc. Then as often as not, they get tired and they leave it. In fact, the football usually explodes. Oddly enough, it turns into water. Mm -hmm. So he's making a connection about the water incident yeah. with the kitchen floor, right. which we first talked about that the Pritchards experienced. Now, yeah. Colin himself went on to form this theory, which he wrote, this is my own theory about the Black Monk case. This is from Kindle Location 2136 of his book, Poltergeist, A Classic Study in Destructive Hauntings. The ground itself contains some peculiar force that favors manifestations, In quotes. The early haunting was triggered by Philip and by his psychological tension. The entity remained in the area until Diane, who herself seems to possess undeveloped mediumistic powers, could provide the energy it needed to manifest itself. When that energy ceased to be available, it again became inactive, perhaps waiting for another provider of energy to offer it the chance to erupt into the space and time of world humanity. So that's where Colin comes down, mm -hmm. and that's where Guy Playfair comes down. You know, there's a lot of people that will say, well, you, first of all, I know that skeptics view both of them as pretty far, I guess, left or however. Out there. Yeah, out there in terms of, they're too open to belief. They're, sure. As we were once accused by a listener of being too credulous. That well, then, then we, are, got the, <laughs> we got it both ways, yeah. which makes me think we're doing something right. <laughs> People yeah. think, again, we say that a lot, but it's either too credulous or not credulous enough. Or not or, credulous enough. Again, that's all depending on your viewpoint. On that's depending stuff. on your yeah. particular point of view. The question is here, you know, if these two guys, if that's what they're going to say, it's their part and parcel. I mean, going back to the Patreon newsletter that we discussed at the very, very top of the show, one of the things that we didn't mention was a dust-up that Tess uncovered that took place between Colin Wilson and his peer, Martin Gardner. Apparently, they used to be on the same team, but they they wound up having arguments about their belief systems. About whose imaginary friend was better. Yeah. And <laughs> she wound up digging up these letters to each other that were that are pretty great. So again, if you're in Patreon, you've got to get that newsletter and read this. But uh, it's a pretty heated discussion about who believes what and why. And I guess when you come back to, you know, what I believe, if anybody cares, or what Forrest believes in this particular case, and Forrest, you can say here in a minute, mm. I guess for me, and I've, I've said this, I've been on a little bit of a journey. I'm in a different spot than I was four years ago when we started this show. I see photos of evidence differently now. I hear different things when I listen to audio. I am more open to the idea that things are going on when I look for evidence. But the more important thing about evidence and proof is that I'm getting to a point where I'm less concerned about the proof. It's like your analogy that you make about, oh, I caught a, a ghost in a jar. Right. You get to a point, especially after you've experienced something, where you don't care. And you really don't care if other people believe what you believe. And that's where I'm headed. I'm not 100% there yet, but I'm headed there. And I think for me, this story has elements of truth in it. Even though there are no photos, there's nothing to go on but eyewitness testimony, interviews, and those interviews may have been conducted by biased people who wanted to perpetuate this story. But a lot of different types of people within this, okay? Relatives who were skeptical, thought it was uh, silly, and the kids were playing pranks, and as well as some local officials. 
So it's a variety of folks. Yes. From this, not just, let's say, a four person family that you're trying to believe. So other people saw very unexplainable kinds of things. I couldn't agree more. Well, I think the best way to end this series is to talk to somebody who has been there and who lives there and who is in that house. I want to set the stage for this interview. We started trying to get this interview a couple of weeks ago. I reached out through the website 30eastdrive.com, which is affiliated with the house nowadays, and the current owner of the house, Bill Bungie, who we had talked about, the film producer. And I was trying to get in touch with Carol, the house's caretaker or key holder, as they call her, because she was mentioned a lot in Andy Evans' book, and it seemed like she'd had a lot of personal experiences there and lived right there, so I thought she'd be somebody good to talk to. So I emailed Bill and Nellie, who take care of the website and the house, I guess, and they got back to me and put me in touch with Carol. Now, Carol is not uh, super into technology, so she was <laughs> – I couldn't really email her. All I got was a phone number for her, and mm-hmm. the first time I called her, I left a message, and it was fruitless, and I left my email address, but – That was pointless, I think, too. So then the next day, I was running out of time. And this was yesterday, folks. This is Friday, by the way, the day. This is uh, September 21st. So this is really right up to the wire for when the show is dropping. I found out that I could text her at that international number. So I texted her, and she wrote me back and said she'd be happy to talk to me at 2 p.m. her time on Friday. So that was 6 a.m. for me this morning, Friday morning here, the 21st. Forrest and I, of course, recorded till midnight, (laughs) Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) trying that because we're so well organized. And uh, then I got up this morning and I gave Carol a call. And for me, an astonishing hour-long conversation that I was just thrilled to get. Now, Carol's got a very thick accent, and at times she can be a little difficult to understand. It's a northern accent. Yeah, and there's a lot of colloquialisms and things like that. So what we've decided to do is we're just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that she covered in my interview. We're going to play you a little soundbite from it, but then we actually sent it out for a transcript, not only for our benefits (laughs) to Mm. understand everything she was saying at every moment. Also, she has a couple of parrots. They're tweeting in the background. (laughs) I knew if I posted this, yeah, Yeah. people are going to be, I can't understand. Understand it. What's with the birds? You know, there's nothing we can do when we call somebody on the phone, just for the record, and right. in another country. So, anyway, we're going to get it transcribed and we're going to be releasing a special show for our patrons at patreon.com that will be her full, unedited interview, complete with a downloadable transcription. And in that show, Forrest and I will be talking about the things that she brings up and is discussing. So, that's basically our first and probably most fully featured. Patreon bonus show that we've ever done. It will be available to all patrons at the dollar and above level as soon as we can get the transcript, which we've already sent out for. We're not sure how long it's going to take to turn that around because we think whoever's doing it is going to be having some issues with some of the things that she said. <laughs> they just need to be from, uh, you know, they Northern They need to be England. from her town, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but she is awesome. Her personality yeah. is awesome. Yeah, she's just a no-nonsense, irrational, reasonable person you don't want to mess with. Yeah. She has a very large family, and she's had a really tough life, honestly. And she talks about that in our interview. And I really enjoyed talking to her. It was truly a blast. So what we're going to do is, Forrest and I have heard the whole interview, And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things she said. I think one of the most amazing things that she brought up was how urban legends have taken over the story. Like with every story. Yes. And and this is something we continue to confirm. And this is what we try to do differently from other shows who do what we do. We try to get to the root of what really happened. Yeah, if we can. I mean... Doesn't always work. Well, it depends on who you talk to as well. And sometimes people aren't around anymore. With everything that you hear, everything that you read... And I don't even care what the source is. If it's in a book, it doesn't mean really anything because all knowledge is borrowed in a sense. It comes from somewhere unless you were the person witnessing it. And then you, we have to trust that witnessing. You know right. what I'm saying? We have to trust that account. So everything you read, just always keep in mind, there could be things that are slightly wrong. And, you know, at the end of it, you're going to have to decide what you want to believe is true. And yes, and who you want to believe. And one of the right. first things that Carol pointed out to me when I spoke to her, well, the first thing she said was that she got tired of correcting authors or telling right. people which books were right and wrong. And she said, no disrespect. And she said this to me. She was very, very sweet about it. She said, no disrespect to you or to Andy Evans or Colin Wilson. Yeah. She said, but the egg story, for example, she goes, that didn't happen at 30 East Drive. That happened in my house. And this is the point that I want to explain to you where Carol lives and who she is. 
You may remember us talking about Mrs. Mountain next door in the one council house, the only one that is adjoined to 30 East Drive. Mrs. Mountain lives at 79. I can't remember the name of the street, but it's not East Drive. It's around the corner. That house, address number 79, is the one that butts up against 30 East Drive. There's a, a shared wall. Right. There's yeah. a shared, there's a common wall like a duplex would have right. here in the States. I don't know if they call them duplexes across the pond. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. It's sounding stupid they'll, underst- they'll understand what yeah, that means. they'll know what we mean. But what has happened is Carol has been married a few times and is currently married to a gentleman named Darren. Darren is Mrs. Mountain's grandson and also the gentleman who had to pick up the puzzle pieces that had mysteriously gotten spilled from a box that was taped shut. And on top of that, Carol told us in her interview that he had actually seen, when he was 10 years old, some very strange markings on some stones over a well underneath the properties at 30 East Drive and number 79. One of them was a triangle with an eye in it. So you have to hear the whole interview with Carol for that, which uh, we're saving for our Patreon members. More on that in a second. And they live at number 79. They are next door right now to number 30. And that's why it makes sense that she's the key holder and the caretaker for number 30. She takes care of it for Bill Bungie. And to be clear, after the Pritchards moved out, no one lived in 30 East Drive in that council house. They put it up for sale. Right. And Carol talks about how she talked to Gene Pritchard about the asking price. Yeah. And it's really fascinating. That's in the interview. That's not in the piece we're playing tonight. Our patrons will get to hear about that part. They put it up for sale and Bill bought it. Right. And Carol makes a very humorous argument about how, you know, you got to be careful what you ask for this because there's a law here that says... (laughs) <laughs> if there's anything wrong with your house, you have yeah. to disclose it in England. Yeah, what she was getting at is that that will affect the price. You have to tell people what's going on. You can get sued. Whether they believe it or not. And I believe here it's state by state. I believe California is a state where if your place is haunted. You have to say you so. You have to say well, so. Well, yeah, you see those signs. You've seen them on the internet at the top over the for sale sign in the oh. yard. It says not haunted. Oh, really? <laughs> I've seen those. And I always thought it was a joke, but yeah. maybe it's legal. Maybe well, if the rumor's out, if word's out, hey, yeah. no, nobody's looking at that place. It's right, haunted. Right, right. Or maybe you happen to know. I think there's some states where you have to disclose if there was ever a murder as well or something uh, like that yeah, in anything, the house. Anything bad, yeah. I mean, there's a story where in uh, New Orleans where, uh, you know, there was a something really bad happened in an apartment, and the landlord had rented out the place. Well, something really bad happened with the oven and the fridge. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And he kept those appliances in there. And 10 tenants later, he'd never told anybody. Yes. So you're, use your imagination, folks, you're using the stove and the fridge. Yeah, where things were prepared besides yeah, just food. Very bad things. Yeah. And people would be upset, understandably. But it's like you always say, when a government or a corporate institution yeah. starts to take notice of something and make rules about it, because theoretically, hey, what does that matter? It's a stove. Right. That's over. Right. It still turns on. It heats yeah. food. Why do you have to tell people? <laughs> Just sell it to the skeptic or the debunker because it should be totally fine. Yeah, Joe Nickel will love it. Yeah, like go in. The, you buy that house. <laughs> see what happens, and uh, you know, see. How I mean, long he probably would there. though. And all due respect to him, we love no, him. It, by the way, I was not making fun of Joe Nickel. Uh, no, he would be like, I'll stay there. You know, no, that's they, probably they what would. he would say. And so. and, and probably nothing would happen. That's yeah. the way that that goes. In this case, though, what she was talking about to Gene was that you have to. Be careful with the price there because you can get sued. Right. Like you can here in the States. So you have to have full disclosure on what you think is going on, whether the buyer believes it or not. You have to let them choose. So Gene adjusted her price. Bill Bunky comes along after, you know, he's made this film about the place and he's really interested in it. So he buys it at a considerably cheap price, which we did indicate that he bought it for not too much. Yeah. Carol talks more specifically about it in our interview, but that in itself is pretty fascinating. What is... Also fascinating about this is how intense her feelings are. She lives there, and she doesn't really have a choice to leave. She has a sense of ownership over this house. And for her, much like it was for the Pritchards, or at least that's how it's been portrayed, they weren't going to be chased out by this thing, whatever it was. I guess the question that I had, even if you were listening to me just a few minutes prior to this, essentially this pickup that we recorded on Friday the 21st, my question about hoax or are things still going on? A lot of times, whether you believe it's a hoax or not, you wonder if things are still going on. This is one of those interviews where you have to decide for yourself. You have to decide if you are going to believe Carol or not. What I can tell you about Carol is she doesn't care if you believe her. And she talks about that in the full interview too. But right now, we're just going to play a little piece of it for you. And uh, if you're interested in hearing the entire interview, 
as soon as we get that transcribed, that'll be released on Patreon to all of our $1 a month and above patrons. And we'll announce that during our regular show. It may be as early as next week. It just depends on turnaround times for the transcription process. So this little section was one we picked out. We're putting it in here continuous. There are no edits in it. You'll hear me saying, yeah, uh uh-huh, like I always do when Forrest is talking or anyone, really. That's the only reason I'm on the show. Yeah, uh (laughs) uh-huh, right. filler. Also, I get to say, wow. (laughs) So (laughs) you're going to hear a couple of responses from me because this was in the middle part of the interview. So for the end of part three of our series on the Black Monk of Pontefract, we're going to take a look at what's going on in that house and the neighboring one now. I don't care where you are, where you go, I will find you. I will sell my soul to the devil, but I will get you. And I become then, how can I say, brave? Yeah. Must be brave. Yeah. Because when someone starts hurting your children, that hurt my baby. It didn't hurt my baby, it hurt my son, but it was touching my baby. And I became like a woman possessed. I used to sit in my children's bedrooms half at night just to protect my children. But, you know, it weren't going to win me. And to this day, I'm, I'm sat here freezing because some coach come in my room now. It can listen into me because it will not drive me out of my home. It will not hurt my children. My two granddaughters now have already been, the, the little one, nine years old, the oldest one, sorry, two weeks ago was banging on my bedroom door at half past two at morning, just screaming the house down. Something had touched her in bed because it was warm. She slept in the shorts and the top. Someone touched her arm and she turned over, ignoring it. Someone grabbed her leg. It left bruises on her leg. It was an imprint. Two weeks ago, this happened. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Sure. It's not going to win. I will make goddamn sure it doesn't win me. Whatsoever. This is my home. And I'm going to keep my home. That's going to wrap up the final part of our series on the Black Monk of Pontefract. We're dark next week, but we'll return the first week in October for one of our only four-week runs of the year, so get ready. Remember to stay tuned after tonight's credits to hear Forrest's reading of the poem Antigonish by Hughes Marins. Please remember to support our sponsors. They keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi. Hi, I'm Corey Wells. Hi. I'm Steve Hayes. I'm Chris Star Marie. And I give permission to astonishing legends to use my voice however they see fit. Galaxy Ride. In perpetuity. Our show is edited by Sarah Wendell, and our theme, which is available as a ringtone, is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to The Ark and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends if you'd like to support the show in that way. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. Yesterday, upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. When I came home last night at three, the man was waiting there for me. But when I looked around the hall, I couldn't see him there at all. Go away, go away, don't you come back any more. Go away, go away. And please don't slam the door. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away.